Hello everyone and welcome back to Disco Elysium. This is episode 22. Last time we were hot on the trail of Ruby and we got close and close and close until we finally got there and teleported to the top of the failed electrical building. We definitely didn't climb that ladder, we teleported. Kim is down the bottom, so we need to find a way to get Kim uh, inside so we don't have to uh, travel alone. But we've entered the ki building, we need to let Kim in as well. Um, so I guess that's what we're doing. And then while we're here, we do need to keep track and be aware of, uh, you know, our other tasks that we have, but the task list is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So I feel like we are definitely pushing uh, closer and closer towards the uh, towards the end of the game. Uh, at least it's feeling like we're we're getting close to potentially, you know, we're confronting one of our prime suspects, whether they did it or not. We're close to con confronting them about it and finding out more answers uh, and. Yeah, the task list being as small as it is means there's only really, at this point, just more of the main task, uh, the actual murder itself, uh, for us to, to focus on uh, this episode. So let's go down into the failed electrical building that we te definitely teleported to the top of, and let's find a way to let Kim in. I was going to say, it might be pretty dark down here without the, uh, with the fact that there's no electricity. So, let's have a torch on, just in case. The glass is covered with grime and dust. You can barely see out. And another postcard, Martinez 98. Let's take a look at this one. A faded picture postcard from the end of the last century shows Martinez as it was before the revolution. It's the height of summer. Rue de saint Lane is teeming with parasol-wielding bourgeoisie and wild pines flags buttress the walkway. Nothing is written on the back. Okay. We head down again. Down even further. Okay, let's have a look. This collapse nearly sealed the basement. One can barely squeeze by. One can barely squeeze by. So I might be able to make it in. Antiquated office furniture, last century maybe? Brought down and forgotten so long ago. This overturned table is covered, covered in orange mildew, crawling with something. Now, I think that the way to let Kim in is around here. Yeah, because... Oh, he's stood right there. Because when we were above, before the ladder, there was like a little entrance... Not an entrance, but what looks like a sewer pipe or something underneath at the bottom that we didn't interact with. So I thought there might be an entrance to the pipe, but there he is. Let's let him in. Two rusty metal plates that slide apart form a crude door. It's been here under the boardwalk for a while. He's just waiting. Who's there? What do you mean, who's there? It's me, Kim. Stop playing around and help me get the door open. Push the doors open. I guess it's just locked from the inside. The doors seem to be on rails, but they've gotten jammed. You grab a side and put some strength into prying it open. With the help of your partner, the two metal panels slide open with a creak. I'm surprised that isn't a physical instrument check. <laughs> huh. I hope no one dangerous heard that. How did you even get there? After you climbed up to the roof, you mean? There's a maintenance entrance under the boardwalk. It's next to a drain pipe, possibly a storm drain. It was easy to miss before. Yeah, so I saw the pipe highlighted, but I didn't see this. He's quite proud of himself. Maintenance entrance, so pedestrian. <laughs> At least now we know a quick way in and out. Yes, we have an exit, so let's get going. Time to investigate these passages. Okay, he peers into the darkness. So let's take a look here. Ah, I see. Right, so it's tucked away underneath the scaffolding, so I think we can walk out now. Ah, not bad. So this is what we could have interacted with here. Clever. Alright. So that's our way in and out. Nice. Nicely done. Uh, looks like a cell's uh, check has been reopened, apparently, according to the map. So we can go and do that again at some point, which is good. Reunited with Kim. Not, uh, we weren't, we're not separated for long. Old file folders in the cart. Documents silvery with mold. 
A series of thick, dusty panes of glass. Ooh, inter interisolary suit jacket, plus one suggestion. Let's take a look at that. A muted brown suit jacket, perfect for a day at the office or an evening at a cafe. The red rose at the bottom of the left breast pocket is slowly wilting. Dressed for the occasion. Nice, it does not go well with those pants. Um, if we're approaching Ruby... I feel like we're gonna need we're gonna need some particular stuff. So I'm gonna let's have a look. The composure pants are a good idea. Our spirit decor jacket for sure. Uh, we're wearing a conceptualization shirt, so I might um might go more into just the logic one. Ah, so we've got the the dress shirt and the jacket actually. We got we got a matching pair. Uh, we've got encyclopedia glasses, which I'm going to keep on, and I think we'll keep on the interfacing gloves while we're down here, as well as perception. Yeah, this seems to be one of the common the common outfits that I wear the most. I think that's like pretty much my go-to. Let's have a look at this before we move too far ahead. It's a, it is a way, oh, okay, we, does Kim come with me? Yes, okay. Oh, that's where we came from, never mind. <laughs> that, that makes perfect sense. For some reason I just totally, my brain totally skipped on the fact that that would have been where we actually came from. In the beam of the flashlight, a crevice in the wall, nice, it was good of us to have a, the flashlight equipped, nice. Revolutionary propaganda on the bunk bed. Ancient flyers and brochures. These pots and plates are full of dust and spiderwebs. The same slit window you saw from the outside. Oh, and we thought that was going down to sewers. Small, stale fabric smell and dust. No one slept here in months, maybe years. A mustachioed and mutton-chopped man, amateurishly depicted, gazes at you with sad eyes. The plaque reads, K. Mazov. There is a spider web in the lower left corner of the portrait. Nice. Mutton chops. I remember when I had mutton chops. I wish I still had them. <laughs> Brush the dust off the portrait. Years worth of dust is shaken off. The full head of hair matched by an ample moustache and sideburns. Look a bit silly. Perfect. Yeah, exactly. So silly. It's better to be clean shaven, for sure. <laughs> Someone crouches, heels digging into wet sand. Hands sweep across the sand. Grain stick into the frayed skin of the fingertips. An old man sits on a slab of concrete and taps his fingers against the glass of a scope. You shudder. Look, Kim, it's Comrade Mazov. Yes, I can see that. Looks like some communists were hiding out here. They left a long time ago. The lieutenant does not seem to share your enthusiasm. A long time ago? How long? Half a century. This was probably part of the network of defense posts the communards built against the insurgents. <coughs> I think the purpose of this bunker was to produce propaganda. It would have had radio equipment by then, but that's all been looted. What's with all these secret weapons ca uh, caches and secret bunkers? We have found a lot of those lately. I guess what most people think of as history tends to linger in rundown neighborhoods. Martinez being what it is, no one has gone through the trouble of cleaning out the old bunkers. Good hiding place for someone who's up to no good. Could it be connected to the Mazov bust we found in the students' room? Millions of depictions of Mazov have been produced. They're not all connected. Besides, that looked like some student. The youths always go for this kind of stuff. Maybe I should move in here. Seems cozy. I won't stand in your way, but only after we're through with this case. Can I now sleep here uh, at night <laughs> instead? That would be an, that would be an interesting one, actually. Could someone have stopped through here recently? You mean like Ruby? No, I think we've stumbled on a piece of history. Leave. It doesn't look like we can interact with the bed where it would usually say it's not time for bed yet, so I wonder if we can. I mean, it's a bed. Ah, oh, revolution. <laughs> yes, the revolutionary's hat. Plus one to the Mesovian socioeconomics. Lovely. 
and Ushanka with the uh, Mazovian logo, a pair of deer antlers on its silvery white front. Your ears feel cuddled and cared for by the state. Uh, friendly neighborhood communard. Wonderful. No more logic. Is it going to say, now it's time to do the thing again? This hat is oh no, there we go. It's different. So warm. It wraps around your head and your mind tingles with all manner of socio-economic theory. Nice. Every time we've had the that the blue speech one pop up, I always get scared that it's just going to repeat the time to get to work, comrade, because we haven't done the stuff yet. This is an Ushanka, right? Pat the hat. Kraz Mazov would have worn this, Yushanka. Mazov knew where to cook those thoughts. That's why it bears a Mazovian logo. Glory to the revolution, comrade. Whether you like it or not, Wearing this hat has made you more communist. You know what? Maybe it's a good idea that we didn't make it in time to the secret meeting, because now I can wear this hat to the meeting instead. <laughs> Perfect. I'll wear this hat. And they'll be like, Perfect, comrade. You'll fit right in. Alright. Let's go around here. Footprints. Boot, boot prints in the sand. One of the soles appear more worn than the other, which I'm pretty sure matches the scene. I'm pretty sure that I remember it being uh, one soul was worn more than the other. There's something in the air, an unnatural buzzing, so the footprints go over that way. The tunnel collapsed, you'll have to find another way around. Naturally. It's getting louder, the buzzing sound. There it is again, like a swarm of hornets buzzing under your scalp. A strange tingling you can almost smell. Lieutenant, do you feel something? No. What do you mean? A pain. A strange tingling. I don't feel it, but we should still be careful. There were footprints back there, and I'm pretty sure they were fresh. Hold on, you really don't feel anything? No, but you are the sensitive one. <laughs> it's not a quib. The situation is dangerous. I saw them too. Footprints with the right sole worn smooth. Looks like our suspect. If she's in here, we need to plan our next step carefully. Once we detain a credible suspect, who knows what the Union and the Wild Pines will do. We'll set in motion events we have no control over. Keep calm. Go over the whole situation in detail. I accidentally pressed enter twice, so I'll read out the logic one I accidentally skipped over. You will upset the balance of power in Martinez. The deadlock between the company and the union will destabilize. We found out Everett's plan to take the harbor. Maybe we should tell Joyce about it? I leave that to your judgment. You already know what I think about cross-pollinating information like this. It's dangerous, but... He just can't be sure. Maybe it will yield something useful. I might just say fuck it and share all the information that we can with Joyce. But then at the same time, I don't know. We've still got a date with the pigs and my gun. We absolutely cannot skip that appointment. Consider that 100% confirmed. I fear you'll need your gun for this. Ah, uh, okay. I feel like what Kim is saying is, Hey... If you've still got stuff to do that you definitely need to do, do that before you go around this corner. I need my gun for this. His hand rests on his holster. It's not enough. You need a gun in your hand too. Your gun. Hmm. We've checked the boy with Clashe's documents. I want to hear her take on why it was empty before. Okay. Why not? Whatever goes down might also affect her. The Union is watching her closely now. Not closely enough, you suspect. But still, good idea to visit her once more. Well, I need to visit her for that, and then I need to visit her for my own personal thing when Kim's not around. <sighs> Which means we might have to wait until... We might have to push our encounter with Ruby to day six. Because I need to get my gun back past ten. I need to put Kim to sleep. So I can uh, have a look to uh, have a chat with Class J, and I need to also attend this meeting as well. How bad do you think things could get? Well, we are not responsible for what we can't predict, are we? I don't think the entire city will be razed to the ground. 
If you can't predict it, there's nothing you could have done. What do you think is waiting for us there? I think I see a cavern. Maybe more cellars? I think we've been careful enough. We still have the element of surprise. I wouldn't be so sure. You haven't exactly been sneaking. Mm. Or maybe not. Either way, once we go deeper, there will be no turning back. Yeah, there will be no turning back. You need your gun for this. What else do you want to run through? Okay. Enter the cavern below the Feld building when you're ready. Note, union and cryptozoology business might end when you do. Okay. We'll come back here. We, we've got to come back. So we've got to let time pass. Um, we're entering. We're entering some serious business then. So I'm going to make a new manual save. Um, I'm going to get out of here, and we're going to have to come back to this. So I need to try and do some effective time management at this point in the game. Uh, I need to. Actually, I can just go out this way, can't I? Um, yeah, I need to do some eff uh, effective time management towards the end of the day where we can make sure that we're running through um, all of our things that we need to do at night. Uh, so we can't do that. We can do that. We can do that. We can do that. Yeah, we're close to being out of, of everything. I mean, something that I can do to pass the time for now is to locate a working firearm that shoots 4.46 ammo. So um, that is something that I am at least able to do at this point in time. Um, I assume, um, while we wait for the time to tick over for, for everything else. So let's try and see if we can find that weapon. I don't know who to ask. Um, gotta, I'll start somewhere and we'll, uh, and we'll, we'll figure it out. So I will run around and search and we'll have some time pass and, and we'll figure it out. Everything important for us today needs to happen at night. So that's kind of the problem. We can also pass time by talking to Idiot Doom Spiral about more of his stories uh, because we do have uh, some wine to give him, also the Pale Edge Vodka. We can also offer him that uh, the Blue Medicinal Spirit. However, because it's an item, I don't know if he will take it. But yeah, there you go. Alright. Searching time begins. Let's retry this check with a cell. All right, we don't have the influence of speed on our side right now, but I am wearing my reaction speed pants. I've put them on. 42%, catch that silver bird. Oh, yes. It nice. Okay. So, obviously we know that we got a success on this one, but then failed with Egghead. So I reloaded to succeed with Egghead, but we traded and failed with a cell. So now we've got a success on both. It's what the nice. Devil, yeah. Excuse me? Now we've run through this before, so I'm just going to go through it. He bought the family a huge because we've done it. After his death, it was a st Aren't there? I took that into not in person. It's a good thing you come on. Okay. No, I don't. Yeah. So we've got that task to ask Everett about a cell in the drug lab now. There we go. All right, we got that task added back to our list. Um, I have been running around, uh, trying like just thinking about what could possibly link to the murder weapon, and I realized that I'm probably coming up on empty because if we look at it, it's like it will take some time. Keep your eyes open and be patient, which means I feel like it's going to come up uh, potentially uh, on its own. I feel like it may come up on its own, uh, so I will just be I will just be patient with it. So we're gonna we're gonna leave that be uh, in terms of the murder weapon. But let's go see if uh, we actually can confront Everard at all. Ah, see, it's it, now that I'm more perceptive, I need to run around the whole map again. Odd that you didn't catch this graffito earlier. Van Eyck Overdrive, it says. Ah, oh, because this is great. Because obviously, because we unlocked the ability to see uh, Van Eyck posters, but it looks like we're also there's also other checks in the world now. Maybe I don't know if that unlocked because of it, or if that unlocked because uh, we've got higher perception, or both. Uh, but it's interesting to see the checks that the checks that pop up that are tied to uh, being more perceptive. I think it's great. All right. I kind of wish that we could uh, fast travel to the docks. I mean, it's not that much of a journey, but it is a bit of a winding pathway. It'd be nice if we could just teleport right in front of Everard's uh, office. <laughs> Instead, I just click as far as I'm able. Okay. 
I don't know if we're going to get anything out of Everart for this, but look, it's a task in our list. We may as well uh, talk to him about it, see what happens. Mr. Dubois, every worker, member of the board, how can I help you today? I met a girl named Cell who said she's working with you. Funny. Hmm. That doesn't ring any bells, Harry. Funny. She was trying to set up a narcotics operation in the old church on the coast. Oh, that a cell. Yes, I do seem to remember sending a pretty young thing down there to liven up the place. Get some anodic music in there. Did you also tell her to start the amphetamine lab? Amphetamine lab? That sounds very immoral and debauched. Frankly, a health risk. <laughs> but what do I know about kids these days? The music they listen to, the drugs they do while they listen to that music. It sounds to me like you are trying to start an amphetamine lab in the district. And you're using some delinquents you found God knows where to set it up and run it for you. Found God knows where? That cell is the daughter of Miko the Kebab. A man who once killed a guy with a kebab. <laughs> yep. I think a daughter of a man who killed a man with a kebab can handle running a little nightclub, don't you? Yep, yeah, this is why we caught the silver, silver bird. Miko the Kebab, really? Maybe it was Bogovic. Or Jakob. I think it might have been Conrad. <laughs> anyway, I shut down the amphetamine production, but let them go on with the nightclub plan. A nightclub? Harry, I'm an old-fashioned guy. After work, I like to listen to some rock and roll music and have a non-alcoholic lager. Nightclubs don't interest me. A, a non-alcoholic lager? Nightclubs don't interest me. But here I am, talking about myself, when you have much more important things going on. Tell me, Harry, how can I help you? Okay, a quick little easy task to complete. There you go. Okay, I, th I think another way for us to be able to kind of pass the time uh, instead of just straight up reading uh, and we can try and make use of dialogue is we can go and talk to Joyce and let her in on some information. Could that be a good thing to do? Quite possibly. I mean, maybe? Who knows? Could be worth trying out. It'll pass the time for a bit, then maybe I'll do a bit of reading to pass the time. Then once we start getting around to 10 p.m., we can start doing things a little more in in sequence. So before we before I travel back, while we're still over this side of town, we'll talk to Class Shea with Kim about the water boy. Um and then we've got, yeah, once 10 p.m. hits, we need to be very quick with what we do. I need Kim as backup for when I need to collect my gun. And then I need to send Kim to bed. And then I need to talk to Classier while I'm on my own. And then I need to go and attend the secret meeting as well. I don't know when the time cutoffs, uh, cuts off for the secret meeting. But we've got from 10 until 2 to get our gun. So... Who knows, maybe I'll end up bringing Kim with me to the... Ooh, hang on, the music's different. Maybe I'll end up bringing Kim with me to the secret meeting, because why not? The music here is different right now. It's a variation of the theme. I guess maybe I haven't been in the whirling around this time of day, because I'm pretty sure it, ch it changes during the time of day, because it's been different in the morning. Nice. Nice. That's 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 a nice little variation of the theme. I wish it still played while you're uh, while you're upstairs. Um, let's get off those reaction speed pants. Okay. Up here we go. Oh, it does play, but it's just like a muffled version. Oh, we can interact with the window again. I think it's green. This window is pristine on the inside, there you go. unlike the one next to it. Light from the deck <coughs> reflects off the glass in an untarnished golden halo. Nice. A visual calculus check so we can now actually identify what's going on with uh, the glass. I think visual calculus is probably only on the glasses. So I can at least put that up one before we proceed. I don't think there's anything else. It's a visual calculus. This window 
is pristine on the yeah. chest. Golden light melts away into the blue. Oh, here we go. Of your mind. In it are two neon lit shapes a man and a woman on the single bed. Perfect. Now, this um, it was con it was someone clarified in I was confused on the position of how everything was when I was trying to imagine it, um, and I and this is really funny. So it was clarified in the in the comments um, the the position that they would have been in for the bullet to enter through the mouth into the brain uh, without there being a, an exit wound on the back, right? So how I was picturing it. Because uh, Class J was going, oh, my back was facing the window. So, um, interestingly enough, my brain did not think that they uh, she would be lying on the bed that way in Missionary, which makes perfect sense because her back is facing the window. Um, and then, obviously, he would be facing the window perfect for the bullet. He would have had his mouth open. And the shot goes in. For some reason, because she said her back was facing the window, my brain just instantly went to, they were probably fucking doggy style. <laughs> so I was just like, my brain was like, yep, they're doing it doggy with her back facing the window, you know, because um, that visually made sense to me with her back actually being away from it. So I was trying to figure out how that would work. Um, you know, but there you go. Yeah, missionary, they're even in that position there while we're uh, looking at this. But this is... I actually, I fucking love this. This is awesome. Uh, seeing it being like uh, visually planned out of where where could this shot have have come from, sort of thing. But yeah, there you go. A two-hearted spider. A two-hearted spider. What position are they in? Certainly not doggy style. Are they in missionary, baby. Like the witness said, the man is kneeling. The woman is on her back. It's the night of March 4th, and a shot has just been fired. The man looks directly at the woman. The shot's possible directions converge in his mouth, a ray cast from somewhere outside, entering his brain. Where does it come from? From the roof outside, location A prime. The glass fractures around the bullet hole, shards face inwards like a corona behind the woman's back. This is great because this is the this is the type of shit where it's like you get into crime scene detective work and you're analyzing it and you're picking it apart. So this here and then you know, uh, at the hanging was very satisfying with a, like a visual calculus detective work pers uh, perspective, like piecing together a crime scene. It's awesome. So looking at this, it has like potential. It's looking like potential locations for the bullet. To, to come from, you know, f much further away instead of what we were talking about with Ruby where she would come up through here, go to the window, shoot him with a rifle, come back down sort of thing. Uh, if, if it being a rifle from like a much, much further distance, you know, because if you shot a rifle from outside the window walking up here uh, and shot a dude in the mouth with a rifle, that bullet's going right through the brain, you know what I mean? <laughs> so it makes... <coughs> <coughs> much more sense that it would come from, um, you know, a, a longer distance. Um, one of those is seemingly somewhere out of reach, all the way over there. I, I don't even know what that what that is. That's, this is where Joyce's yacht used to be. This is the church. And we've been able to go up here, which is, that's the weapons cache. Uh, this is near the Feld building. Uh, where Ruby is believed to be currently hiding out, but up here is interesting because this is a location out of reach. Let's inspect the ghostly figures. The man does not know the bullet has entered his brain. He never will. Death comes faster than the realization. Have a look at point A, the roof. The ray cast from the man's mouth unravels into a fan of possible directions, all on the roof at first. The shot could have come from any of them. This is composite location A prime, most likely of the origin points. Shouldn't there be gun residue outside? There could have been. Then the rain and slush and wind washed mm. it away. This was more than a week ago. So it says, so I'm what, 80% sure the roof is where the shot was made from? Hmm. 72%. <laughs> an antique weapon that fires military grade ammunition. A Belmagrave rifle, for example. This is a good short distance, but not too short. 
the perpetrator aimed with their back against the railing, or possibly kneeling for precision. This would explain why it only took them one shot. The lights were on in here. Outside it was dark. It was like shooting fish in an aquarium. A well-lit aquarium. The victim opened his mouth to let the bullet in. Neither of them would have seen anything outside in the darkness. Too busy with their own bodies. It's like shooting fish in an aquarium. A well-lit aquarium. Wow. Could the shot have come from inside the room? A closer point. That's way too close for a rifle shot, though. Point X would contradict the woman's testimony, rendering the entire proposition void. These figures would be wiped out, detective. Are there any arguments against A prime, the roof? None that you've found thus far, but that doesn't mean there aren't any. Mm. Could there have been another point of origin further away? That's a 28%, yes. In this model, the shot could have come from a greater distance. Nothing excludes the possibility. Should we extrapolate to include every possible point of origin in Martinez? Hell yeah, extrapolate the radius to include all of Martinez. According to your map of the district, this shot could have come from a wide angle of locations, starting with the northern edge of the abandoned boardwalk, ending with an islet in the bay. Let's call them B Prime. An islet in the bay, okay. And that's somewhere that we're not able to reach. More precisely? B Prime for boardwalk, B Double Prime for Land's End, and B Triple Prime for the islet, detective. Land's End. There may be small end. points in between, but those are too fine to zoom in on. Land's End, okay. Let's go in order, the boardwalk. The man does not know the bullet has entered his brain. Oh, I've pressed the wrong button? The boardwalk? Yeah. 700 meters away, the likeliest of these B positions, 20% chance. A skilled sniper could have made the shot, provided he had a safe sniper's nest. Even with the light on inside, we're talking military training. At that distance, the perpetrator would have had to take wind direction into account. Interesting that visual calculus, uh, when talking about uh, the person that made the shot, instead of addressing it as a not without confirming the, the gender of our of our murder suspect, whether it was female, male or otherwise, uh, it visual calculus straight up is going provided he had a safe sniper's nest while we have female suspects. Uh, so it's interesting that they don't sort of go provided they had a safe sniper's nest. Um, I don't know if that is a oversight in the in the dialogue or whether that's there because uh you know maybe it, it is a male sniper and the dialogue is kind of given that away but um yeah instead of them keeping the dialogue um what's the word that i'm looking for ambiguous to to the gender it is actually focusing on one in particular so have a look at point b2 land's end 1.2 kilometers away, the least likely of these positions. Let's say 3%. A truly skilled sniper could have done it, possibly from a tent. No, too far-fetched. Have a look at point B3, the islet. One kilometer away, a point beyond the docks, on an islet in the bay. The fort is ruined, but the perpetrator may have found a stable spot on the beaches surrounding it where the concrete crumbles into the sea, as you saw in the coin-operated view. All oh, right, yeah. The shot would have been a small miracle, 5% likelihood. There is an extremely narrow field of view from the bay to the window, between Rue de saint Gislain 10 and 33A. The angle would have been extreme, and access to the islets is questionable. But you're saying there's a chance. Kim, do you think the shot could have come from further than the roof in Martinez? From where, precisely? Let's say B prime, the boardwalk, B double prime, land's end, B triple prime, the islet. I see you have given this a lot of thought. Are those the locations you've singled out in addition to the roof? And what is the likelihood, in your opinion, that it came from a further distance? Much less than from the roof, but still. Okay, well, we should see if there is gunshot residue or sniper nests if we go down the coast. Rule these spots out one by one. How do we get to the islet, though? It would be the diligent thing to do. Until then, personally, I'm going with the roof version. It fits the hidden path through the whirling. A simple hypothesis. Well, Kim's going to go with the, the hidden path through the whirling. I think that it might that might be a cover-up. 
I think that might be another cover-up. Or just convenient footprints. I feel like it's, it's come from further away. Um, because those footprints don't match anything that we are currently aware of. And it doesn't match any of the Hardys whatsoever. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't think that the rooftop method is the one. But that's cool that we were able to reconstruct the, the scene in that way. That was really cool. And it opens up more possibilities. Officer, it's a fine day for questions. Why do I feel like you've won here? Interesting. I found your boy. It was empty. Just seawater. Oh. Did you take the document? No, of course not. As I said, it would have been too risky for me to use those documents anyway. My employer gave them to me. In truth, I should have destroyed them. I'm afraid you may be in danger. Yes, I am. Regardless of who took the documents. It was probably just an accident. I was worried at being too careless with the latch. The documents were probably just washed away. The words, washed away, sound distant and strange suddenly. Somewhere far away, a dog barks. I'm considering it was filled with water and stuff, I wouldn't be surprised if maybe it had, you know. Why do I feel like you've won here? I really don't know, sir. I certainly don't feel like I've won. I feel like shit, sir. All the time. She smiles. A bitter little smile. She means it. But this turned out well for you. You've slipped past all suspicions. Clearly, I haven't. We're having this conversation, aren't we? How well could it have gone, I mean? The rain falls on her shoulders, tinting her blonde hair light brown. It smells of industrial pollution and brine. I'm stuck in Martinez just like all of us. I've been up here for... I don't know how long now. I like to call this my rooftop containment facility. What are you contained for, then? For my sins, of course. The long-standing sins of a bad, frivolous person. For destroying my first love. For working for bad people. The list goes on and on. Something seems off with this theory I've developed about Ruby. I don't know what to say. It all seems fortuitous. For you. None of this is fortuitous for me. Well, this all turned out well enough for you. You somehow managed to not become a suspect. Did I? Why do I still feel suspicion hanging over me then? What I managed was to get him killed. I'm the love that does people in, remember? The lieutenant looks away, over the railing. He feels uncomfortable with this conversation. He doesn't know what to add. That's it then, I guess. She nods, slowly, carefully even. There is suddenly a strange glint in her eyes. Not malicious. But dangerous. And then we can go back to the lies that she's told. But I feel like we'll go... Maybe I'll go into those things without Kim later on. Uh, and then also talking about my room. So I think we'll return. I will return to that one later. When Kim's not around. <laughs> Need to do something behind his back. Sneak out while he's gone. Determine where the shot came from. Check the boardwalk. Check island. How do we check the island and check land's end? How do we check the island? We can go to the island? Can we ask Joy? We can ask Joyce. If she'll take us there on her yacht, I suppose, right? That's a working boat. This will take some time checking out the locations. This will take some checking out of locations. Okay. Um... Let's go have a look at those locations then. Okay. It says to check the boardwalk, and I believe this is said boardwalk. Um, nothing is highlighted though, except for the bin. There's some tear. 
which we've already investigated when we were last here. Um, looks like this used to be where the Ferris wheel was, yeah. Hang on now. Unless the boardwalk is over here. seeing anything being highlighted down in this specific area though. Oh hang on, here we go, more perception. The faded remains of a poster with the date 46. A name is faintly legible, Arno Van Eyck, nice. So that's like one of the posters that comes out. Um, okay. Maybe up here. This, this is can all classify as the boardwalk, I suppose. Um, okay, something here. A door, a building, a hiding place. Could the instigator be inside? That's not. Nothing has popped up around this area in relation to the boardwalk. Because this is something different. We'll reconstruct this scene when we look at it. Ghostly shades facing the crumbling wall. With another seven shades standing. Mm. A cold sea behind this building. The other one. Once filled with engineers and designers. Hmm. Felled electric. You feel drawn to the mural again. Yeah. Um... Okay, well, we can at least check out Land's End. It's the Water Boy. It's dead end. It's interesting that it's saying, like, this will take some time, but I feel like we should be able to... There should be certain sections that we should be able to investigate or check at this current point in time but I guess we'll start at Land's End first just looking for anything new that's highlighted an old door worn by oh there we go guards the depot could this structure have been used to take the shot from here to the whirling I can't see how the church is in the way. Okay. The church is in the way. It could be from this tower. I'm getting stuck in the environment. Is there something here that ah. would indicate a sniper used mm. this place as a nest for taking the shot? Just some urban detritus, a bottle, and a dilapidated old comms tower. Okay, so a visual calculus pops up with a check. That's how what we're looking for. In the distance, you can hear the breakers roar. I don't see it, Lieutenant W. Freitor. I don't see a person take a shot here and hit something there. In the whirling in Iraq. Maybe the campfire was used by the perpetrator. To warm his hands before pulling the trigger? Perhaps. But anyone could have made this. The coast is specked with fires this time of year. Truthfully, this seems like a very poor choice to take a 1.2 kilometer rifle shot from. Visibility is awful. There's water vapor everywhere. I think we can rule out... Beatable Prime, was it? Maybe the assailant climbed the comms tower and took the shot there. It's not possible to climb that ladder, and even if it were, why? There's no platform up there to aim from. It does look extremely rickety, and wouldn't help much either. What about the cigarette butts? Those? A smoking assailant who favors Tumutiri to Astra or Juan? Cigarette butts are everywhere. This is a common brand for all men. Still, you felt it was important enough to make a mental note. That means something. You didn't pay attention to any of the other cigarette butts on the coast. 
Getting those XP points though. Look over the water to the Whirligan Rags. There, 1.2 kilometers over the wave crossed bay. Through heavy, dark gray curtains of rain, you see the smallest rectangle, barely visible. A glowing light on the third floor of the Whirlingham Rags. With binoculars, you would see a young woman's shape move behind the glass, her limbs long and slender. Finished thought. All right, we can rule out that. The boardwalk and the island. I'm thinking we can talk to Joyce. We can tell her some information at the same time and then see if she would maybe take us over to the island. Um... So I need to walk around the boardwalk until we get that uh, that blue thought bubble popping up. And it was not popping up. Oh, God. I'll just have to run around a very specific spot of the boardwalk, I suppose, for it to actually appear. But the church is also kind of in the way here as well. It's a long way down to your death from here. 20 meters at least. Okay, I'm standing here, walking around on the boardwalk. And I'm not getting any visual calculus checks. So I'm just going to have to keep running around this area until one appears, I suppose. Um, I've run around everywhere, and I can't see anything. You should take out your flashlight. Uh, this is the, this is the boardwalk area. Uh, there's light somewhere in this place, right here, through this hole. <laughs> through this opening, there, they climb up the ladder and shoot it out there. Is it? Okay, is it? Could this have been the killer's height? There you go. Oh my god. A window. The point of origin of the shot that killed the mercenary. A tiny shot through here. This does look like an embrasure. A slit made for shooting out of. Peek out. Outside the window, another day. The beach sand soaks up the drizzling rain, growing darker and darker. Could the killer have used this as a hideout? It's a great place to hide. And Mazovianism and murder are certainly not mutually exclusive. But there hasn't been anyone here in ages. Kim, I can't see the whirling in rags. The shot didn't come from here. Indeed. Nice. No one could get a clear view. Well, at least we've been thorough. I like thorough. Which means... In fact, I think we're done with this bunker. After you, officer. Which means... The island. How do we check the island? My current standing theory is that we need to talk with Joyce. Oh, look at the rats running across the floor. If we talk with Joyce, we'd be like, You have a yacht. Get us over to the island, please. And we'll see if uh, she actually... Um, see if she actually obliges or not, huh? Only one way to find out. Just gonna run up to the church so I can just travel to the fisherman shacks. Let's see how much information we want to give to Joyce as well. You're back. Good. What can I help you with? Not an umbrella, I hope. I don't need one myself, you see. <laughs> All around you, rain keeps falling down. On the wooden boards she's standing on, and on the water around you. When we can't buy the raincoat from Frit, we can only steal it, and that's why we haven't gotten it yet. <laughs> Neither do I. Pat your similarly wet cloak. Very rugged. Good choice. Now, I suspect you had questions. 
Nothing like talking to pass a rainy day. Am I right? Um, talk more about the boat. Well, technically speaking, I'm not oh, half good. Okay. Um, nothing pops up to ask her about the island. Oh. Ma'am, this whole thing is a takeover. He asked me to do an envelope, the heat. Okay. Let's share the information, because shit's going to go south. This whole thing is a takeover. A takeover? Yeah, it's not a strike. You aren't being let in because there's nothing to negotiate. The Union is taking the terminal. If they're taking it... Green livery, changing into red, blocked by blocked. She looked toward the colourful mountain of crates, like toy blocks rising above Martinez. Like a cancer of the blood, metastasizing. Then we're talking about a war. Everett needs to let me into the harbour at once. We need to talk about this. He's ready for a war. They all are. They most certainly are not. Cronell has a thousand men on their payroll. The next batch will be a platoon of 20 men and a gunship. I've seen the Union's forces. They are better organized than these mercenaries. They also have the support of the people of Revachol West. It will take more than Cronell to wipe them out. Wild Pines will need to send more and better equipped men. Make no mistake, ma'am. I am sure you have the money. The question is, how many years and how many lives are you willing to sacrifice? Mm. What do you suggest I do? It's not the RCM's job to make these decisions, Joyce. The workers should have the harbour, cut off the snake's head, Everard's pushing all this. It's a bluff, call it, have them open fire and see how long they last. Bring in everything you have and wipe them from the face of the earth. It's apocalypse o'clock, time to commence the gloaming. I wish there was a disco option. <laughs> First, will this affect your decision-making process? Everything affects the decision-making process, detective. Officer? The lieutenant's face conveys uncertainty, he doesn't even sound angry. For once. I don't seem to know what the right thing to do is. It's not the RCM's job to make these decisions. It's right. That's right, Harry. But also, what's Harry's d decision? What does Harry think? It's either, hey, I don't want any part of this, or, hey, let them have it, or go fucking all in and wipe them from the face of the earth. Which is literally just repeating history, isn't it? Like, how... The coalition came in and just, during the revolution, just wiped out everything. And we're trying to rebuild communism. I wish there was a disco option. I'm afraid we won't disco our way out of this one. Look at your risk. It's apocalypse o'clock. Time to commence the gloaming. <sighs> Maybe so, detective. But that doesn't mean we are not obliged to try and stop it. He's right. There will be slow, simmering, hideous civil war. The beginnings of a failed state. No apocalyptic rapture. Just ugliness. So, what are you going to do? What will I do? Her arms fall to her sides. Her spine relaxes. Did I ever tell you how they discovered this Isola? During our reality lowdown? No, ma'am. It may be the only break we've ever caught as a species. The last one for 400 years. I just want to refresh her in case she didn't actually tell us, because I can't remember now. It's been a while, uh, it's been a while since our reality lowdown. Why? The nations who colonized this Isola called theirs Moindi, the world. It was all they knew, all they thought would be. That there would be something more was a gamble, akin to another world, or life after death. The pale was thought to be impregnable, perpetual. Irene la Navigateur, the Queen of Siren, sent eight expeditions, one after the other, into the mass at the edge of the world. <coughs> Five of the crews did not return. Two did, but had lost their minds. Each of those expeditions would have been led by an admiral. Sounds like a purge. Like she was purging her political rivals. Sounds cruel. There was no precedent for such an undertaking. People thought she was punishing the admirals, or had gone mad, or both. Until after years of trial and error, and the development of a strict 
Psychological regime imitating the creation process of poetry. Called Volta Domar, or Return from the Sea. The Eighth Expedition returned, sane and intact. They told of a new continent of matter. They told the Queen and her counselor, Dolores Day, that the Pale had begun to condense, day after day, hour after hour, minute after minute. Hmm. Slowly raining down until it formed a vast ocean. The air is cold and scented with petrichor. There are rain circles on water all around. Humidity crawls up your back like a piano trill. Put your hand in the rain. So does the lieutenant. His mouth is slightly open as he looks to the sky. The droplets feel warm like spring rain. This ocean? The phenomenon has never again been encountered. For a time, the crew thought they were experiencing a hallucination. The mass hand proclaimed, Lancelind, Lancelind, the signal to wake up. But they could not. They were sane and conscious as islands began to appear on the horizon. There are 78,000 uninhabited islands in the Insulindian archipelago, officer. The freckled face of God. <laughs> You've thought it a million times. After life, death, after death, life again. After the world, the pale. After the pale, the world again. A total shift in human comprehension of reality. On the second day, a great skewer was shot down above the flagship Lizarjik. The bird was preserved and brought back, along with pollen. God, the, the pale is, is just so mind-boggling. Four years later, the Ooh. Queen's counselor was proclaimed her innocence, Dolores Day, the elected world spirit. The age of humanism, internationalism, and parliamentary rule followed. We were high. We were high. Let's take a look at that. The Insulindian Miracle, 7 hours and 45 minutes. You were reminded of a poem somewhere deep inside you, the translation of which you don't remember. Nella sarà cambiato della luce, it begins. Colori cam grigio e muron, tutti stampati uno sull'altro. Trovai un vuoto, una macchia bianca, gli altri guardarono. This is terrible because I am saying this for the very first time, just trying to read it. She bella gionata, she bel tempo, ma senti la rotativa. Okay, maybe some of that was okay. Probably butchered most of that. You were reminded of it when you heard about the discovery of Insulinda. But what does it mean, and how do you know it by heart? Interesting. We do have two more sections for thoughts here. So, I don't know. God, there's so many. I don't know which one to pick, but we'll see. I can unlock two and start internalizing them. I'll, I'll give it a thought. I'll give it a think before I choose a thought, and then we will see. Leaving us here. On Caillou. The pebble. The largest of the fertile, uninhabited islands of the northeast Insulindian archipelago. Four centuries and two revolutions later, the Great Skewer was the first bird they saw. The first living autonomous organism. Proof of reality. It's the symbol of Insulinde, Detective. Mm. The coat of arms of the suzerain and the wings on the crest of the commune. Well, I seem to have it in for it. Or it for me. I broke one. <laughs> in your defense, it is a nasty creature who plucks food from the throats of lesser birds. Yet much like Revachol, it is also magnificent. And rare. Imagine the suzerain of seagulls. There was a sting in your heart at the mention before, when she said its name. And this was the last break we got? The nations of Mundi proceeded to discover five more Isolae, or they discovered us, all in the rush of the great inter Islary reconnection. But these others weren't uninhabited. We had to kill people there. Wipe out indigenous populations, gunboat economies, or they came to do the same for us, or had done to each other. There was no one but the skewer, the Liliat Sayer, and the Blood Beach, and the River Esperance. It was the new, new world. The Mondials used it to amass the greatest concentration of wealth mankind has ever seen. 
Revachol. The suzerain. What happened? Revolution. Poverty. And the mercurial rise of capitalism. It's raining. It is. Soon it will be spring and everything will blossom. The gangs will run wild. Taking motor carriages, ferrying amphetamines through Cold City. Spring is tough in Revachon. Wow. What will you do? I will surrender Terminal B to the Union. Wow. Is that within your means? She puts her hand in the rain. She's silent for a second. We will see. Ma'am, this may well unravel property law this side of the river. If that occurs, we may never see the end of this kind of confrontation. The next time there will be two strikes, then four, then a hundred. What happens will happen. She takes the end in her rain slick hand and starts untying the knot. The age of capital has only begun. I will talk to my employers in person. We will amputate and cauterize Martinez. If you handle the situation on the ground. You're going now and we? She generally avoids that term with her employers. Wow. It's a 92% red check of rhetoric. There are no employers. She's a member of the board. Probably a partner. You are the Wild Pines. There are no employers. You are the citizens' militia. There are no superiors. What? Of course I have superiors. That's right, detective. And next time, you should confer with them before you go setting events in motion. Despite his words, he's not really sure whether to be annoyed with you or not. Events are already in motion. Whether your actions accelerated or momentarily retarded their progress, even the lieutenant cannot really say. Even after all this time, I still don't really understand who you are or what your angle is. I have not deceived you. I told you exactly who I was. Rejoice, Leighton. Rejoice, Missia. Rejoice, Leighton. Rejoice! You're going now? Yes. Mr. Clare has a two-month head start. I can't let it grow any bigger. And I've exhausted all my options from here. Before you go, can you give us a ride to the island and back? Understood. Let her go. Keep the peace. And I will keep my end of the bargain. How far along is Cronell's investigation? A confrontation is imminent. They have followed in your footsteps. Mm. As your investigation reaches a climax, so does theirs. They are your shadow. Arm yourselves. Armor yourselves. Jesus. Protect their targets. Violence may be unavoidable, but we can limit the casualties. When will they make their move? Where? Soon. I do not know precisely. They have cut off all communication, you see. They know I've been feeding you information. Fuck. One last thing, Lieutenant Dubois. I've given the matter much thought and come to this conclusion. You're not an amnesiac. You're insane. Ah, uh, it's so disco, baby. I know, because I too I'm insane. I just hide my illness better. And I'm rich. <laughs> <sighs> Goodbye, nether creature of the forbidden swamp. Isn't everybody a little insane? No, detective. No one's as insane as you. Don't worry, madame. I am very sane. I don't know, Kim. What if I'm not even real? What if, what if the actions of Harry are being controlled by some higher power? And it's not actually Harry that's insane at all. You're over-radiated? I'm overexposed, baby. My travels take me through the pale dozens of times a year. I've got the longing. And I've got it bad. She would die to return to it. The pale. The past. Anything one can return to. How do you keep it together? The same strict psychological regimen the 8th Admiral developed when he crossed the Pale and discovered this Isola. The Volta do Mar. It's used by inter travelers and other troubled souls, even to this day. You could use a little of it yourself. <laughs> Interesting. Goodbye, 
Rejoice, Slayton. Watch out for yourselves. They will strike soon. Wow. Secret task. Find solution to the strike deadlock. She smiles. She's gone. The lieutenant watches her boat grow smaller on the bay. Its white sails fluttering. Well, we are not hitching a ride on that boat. With worry in his eyes, he does not know if it was the right thing to do. But he doesn't say anything. You wonder what Everard has to say about this. Slowly, the sails turn grey-blue as more oxygen gets between you. Wow. Okay. I'm gonna... I'm gonna assume... That maybe our way of, across the island might just have to come along automatically, because... I can't think of any other way to get over there, so it might just have to come later and we might have to be patient. Um, it's said that we wonder what uh, Everard has to say about this, so I'm going to go talk to Everard um, and see if we can see if there's any more dialogue that's opened up with him, but we all know how this is going to go, <laughs> which is he just goes, I don't know what you're talking about, Harry. So... The ship has sailed. Did you see it? I know you did. Tell me, what did it look like as it grew smaller and smaller when that mainsail dropped behind the horizon? There's a mean little light in its eyes. Did it look like a germ? Did it look like a piece of bacteria? His tone is totally different now. The jolly man of the people is gone, and so is the smile. You get a sinking feeling. <laughs> no need to be overly dramatic. I don't understand. What do you mean? Don't worry, Harry. He does. At least I think he does. You wanted us to relay all this information to her. That this is a takeover? That I want a war? God, I hope you also told her about the drug trade. They absolutely hate getting their hands dirty with that. Well, I mean, she came to me about the drug trade. That's how this whole thing started. You can kill a million people, but if you do something the police doesn't like, well, then you're out of the yacht club. Goodbye, you inhuman fuck. Jesus. Now I know where you've been so forthcoming. No, no, Harry. What we have is real. We're working men. This here is real. So this was your plan all along, for me to relay this information to her. Harry, I can't see into the future. We are all playing by ear on this planet. I had no idea she'd react so strongly. But you did want me to relay info to her. I did. I knew the negotiations would go better with police officers telling her horror stories from inside the harbour. It's scarier this way. Turns out it was a magnificent strategy. I never thought it'd so fundamentally fuck her up. God, he's and now now he's just and I I like how they made the point to notice that he uh, to note earlier on that he doesn't swear often when he did swear like it sounds like a gun going off and then he's in a he's in a mood now he's just letting it go. How do you know she left? Harry, I bumped her cabin. I bumped her whole boat. I had cameras surveying her boat. Hell, I even wanted to bug that thermal cap, but my boys advised against it. They must have done it while Joyce was busy questioning the locals. So you've been listening to our conversations all the time? Not me personally. I had guys recording and processing this information for me. The Hardy Boys? Hell no. They'd fuck it up. They can't do anything right. I mean my real boys. My special task force boys. Where are these boys? They sure as hell aren't hanging out in the open with beers in their hands for the cops to question. <laughs> They're pros, Mr. Kitsuragi. You used me. Harry, you made a conscious decision to relay that information to her. Uh, yeah. You could have kept it for yourself. <laughs> I know! But exploring dialogue options is what I do best. Sometimes. <laughs> but she told me a beautiful story about the discovery of the insulin day. But she said she's insane, like me. You used my intellectual curiosity against me, exactly. <laughs> Against you? Oh, Harry. 
I'd like to think I used it for you. But she told me a beautiful story about the discovery of the Insulinda. Of course she did. Rich people have the best stories. About all the interesting things they've done and seen. All the beautiful places they've been to. It's just sentimentalism. She can afford to be sentimental, and she can afford to lose as well. But she said she's insane, like me. She's not insane. What did she tell you? She told me she's over-radiated from pale transit. No, she's not. She's a sentimental alcoholic. They all are. Never take a drop and you'll be eight laps ahead of those upper-class winos. Just like old Mr. Clare here. Try it. You'll be a real super detective. <laughs> oh, fuck off. I don't drink more than anybody else. It's actually good advice. I might. If that's what it takes, I'll do it for the working class. Fuck off, Everard. <laughs> See? This is what they want us to do. Suck on that sugar and wine teat until we're insane like they are. You've got to be smarter than that, Harry, or you'll lose. So what's going to happen now? What was always going to happen? We take the harbour and she fucks off to Ozon, uncorks a bottle of wine, calls her partners and says they need to distance themselves from this nasty business before the big shit spinner splashes everyone. Only difference is the Union doesn't have to lose 2,000 men to machine gun fire. She was my beautiful lady. I have a bad taste in my mouth. You better make sure this ends up saving lives. That it will, Harry. That it will. As to the bad taste, please. You're not a sommelier. You're a cop. You knew something. Something big. And you wanted to see what happens when you tell someone. So you told her. Anyone who's ever been close to power will tell you. Inside information is the sweetest thing in the world. It's better than money. It's better than pussy. Money only makes you special for some salesman. Pussy only makes you special for yourself. Information makes you special for all mankind. It's the ticket to history. That quote <laughs> is fucking... Oh, man. Dude, the writing in this game. God, it's so good to hear even the characters you don't like talk. It's, it's spectacular. It does make sense when you word it like that. Damn right it does, Harry. What you did was participate in history. When history calls, you have to pick up. You had no choice. None of us ever do. A hard disco cop like you, I knew you weren't one to resist temptation. You know what, detective? I am going to leave this out of my report, and I suggest you leave it out of yours, too. <laughs> Just look at the three of us. The three careless boyaderos. Good times, good times. So what the fuck now? Now we let bygones be bygones because there's work to do. For me and for you. I suppose there was a reason you came here, so let's have it. What can I help my best friend and comrade with today? I'm always happy to educate and entertain you, my friend. So, what's on your mind? Let's, let's say this option now as well. Why not? The signatures I got. I know you plan to force them out with the construction noise. Harry. By now, you should know I would never do anything tricky like that. However, if the construction noise and limited street access make some people consider moving, well, let's just say there'll be freshly renovated buildings near the roundabout where those poor people can finally enjoy a significant uptick in quality of life. I'm talking real affordable workers' palaces. He proudly spreads his hands to demonstrate the size of the palaces. They're very large. So the village is doomed. You were there. You saw the place. A wasteland. There's nothing left. But mark my words, officers. We are going to reset it. Reset. I have big plans for Martin A's. And they do not include humans living in those pig sheds on the coast. That land will be used for municipal buildings and commerce. What do you mean? Harry, imagine a youth centre supermarket church complex. <laughs> Employing hundreds, no, thousands of people. The coast will be lit up with enterprise and life. All those ruins out there turned into low-income housing. Harry, enough is enough. We're taking this district back. The war was 50 years ago, for God's sake. It's time to move on. Youth supermarket church complex. Do you really expect me to believe that? Yes, I do. I got the centre. I got room for a retail complex. 
And in four years, I'll get the church too. The wheels are already turning, Harry. The wheels of progress. This post-war limbo, I won't stand for it. There are kids practically playing with their own feces out there. It cannot go on. No, it's like they're playing with marbles, man. There is true indignation in his voice when he speaks about the state of things, and even a touch of pain. And then there will be a giant statue of him towering above it all. Wait, but will you erect a statue to yourself? I'm not a symbolist, Harry. I'm a realist. My statue will be Martinez rebuilt. Five-story building complexes, kids off speed, and landowners in a zon hating me. That will be my statue. And yours. We're doing this together. I knew you were up to something. Damn right I'm up to something, Harry. I'm gonna make the working man as rich as Joyce Messier. That's my job. Just like yours is to keep the peace. Okay. Very nice, Harry. Finger gun, we're out of here. Okay. We're out of here. Okay. Interesting. It is now 7.30. We've done probably as much speech as I can do for now. So maybe I might read to pass the time. There's nothing new for us to read, though, that we have, I believe. So I'll just be rereading stuff to pass the time until we get to 10. And that's when the big stuff goes down. That's when we're going to get into the big stuff, because that's when we have to think about the secret meeting, getting our gun back, interviewing Classier when Kim goes to bed, and then confronting Ruby on day six. And then seeing what comes after that. I believe we have, was it like eight days, seven, eight days? Uh, based on the conversation that we had with someone, they're like, you've got like, you know, maybe like eight, nine days or something like that before shit starts to blow up. So I feel like we still have some time to do things, which is good, but it looks like we're getting close to, to wrapping some things up. So let's, let's get 10 PM. Let's get, let's, let's get 10 PM happening. And then hopefully everything will fall into place nicely tonight. Alright, so it's past 10 now. We can finally get to what we need to do. Uh, we've got a couple of skill points laying around, so I'm going to put some points uh, into some of, my, some of my skills up here. Um, I was thinking of doing thoughts before we read books to pass time, but I was like, Maybe I'll leave. Maybe we'll do some more thoughts tomorrow instead. Um, but I kind of want to up some of these instead. So I'm going to level up those with our four skill points. Um, and now I was going to go to the meeting, the secret meeting without Kim. But I think the best way to do this, to make this work for time, because I, ooh, because I want Kim... Um, with me for when we get the gun and the woman who's there with the gun will be there until 2 a.m. We'll do the meeting first Then we'll go get the gun Then we'll send Kim to bed and then I should be able to talk to Classier Alone, I think that's how I can do it Otherwise the other alternative is we go and do the gun first then send send Kim to bed then I can talk to Classier and do the meeting. I'm just not sure when the meeting cutoff is, so I'm trying to figure out if there's a good way to be able to juggle all of these things at once. <laughs> there is something down there. Oh, interesting. Look at, look at the perception checks that we've got now. A message has been carved into the wall. Trance Nation, Ike Nation. Ah, lovely. Okay. So, we'll... we'll test and we'll see how long this meeting takes right if we do the the secret meeting first we'll see how long it takes we have to figure out where this meeting is being held in here first 
Uh, I'm pretty sure... I'm pretty sure it must be one of those doors out on the balcony that are not even highlighted, but they might have a person in front of it now. No. These two doors still don't have... Okay, where do we go? Attend Stebbins meeting after 10 at the Capeside Apartments. Okay. Which... Hmm. Okay. It might be just the... The abandoned ones all the way at the other the other end here. Then, oh, or it could be that room. Is it in here? Or in here? Hang on. As you approach the metal grill, you can yes. hear several voices having okay. what appears to be an animated discussion. It, it, the secret meeting occurs in here. Okay, here we go. This must be it. Beyond this door lies the beaten heart of radical communism in Martinez. Somehow, the night air softens the smell of trash and sea brine. As the breeze pulls through the canvas like a shuttle through a loom, you catch a hint of something unexpected. Something earthy warm and burnt the acrid smell of failure no that's just slightly burnt coffee a smell you would recognize anywhere just look at these pigs sniffing about after hours why didn't you say the secret door was right behind you must have slipped my mind you know how it goes the metal grill is cool to the touch you notice the lieutenant is looking uncustomarily anxious. His posture is rigid. His right hand hovers near the zipper of his jacket. He wants so badly to draw his armistice, but he also doesn't want to want to draw it. You okay, Kim? Oh, I'm fine. I was practically born to infiltrate underground communist cells. He takes a quick look over his shoulder. Which is just to say... We should be prepared for any eventuality. Try to listen. You can make out at least two separate voices. Two voices, both male. Approximately early twenties. Okay. Fear for Riddles now. I have it. It's going to work. I can feel it. Bang on the grill. The clang of metal reverberates all along the scaffolding. The voices coming from the other side fall silent. And I've just lost my webcam give me a second it has decided to shut off there we go welcome back um i'll keep an eye on that it's not running hot or anything so i don't know what's happened there i'll keep an eye on that one that was weird who's there is that you Maurice? can't i say the secret thing <laughs> why do i have to say i'm the police are you all communists? I'm looking for some communists. Who said communists? Did we say communists? Get out of here. Listen, I've already built like 0.0001% of communism, but now I need to get organized. Can you help me? For a moment, silence. A slight sensation of static electricity as before a storm. A miniature conference is taking place inside, and you are the subject. What's the passphrase? Here we go. Wait a minute. I know the passphrase, don't I? One, two, three, four. It's this one. Remember De Breva and Abadanez. There's no response. You begin to wonder whether they've slipped out some back way. No, they're still there. You can feel them back there. All right. The key stick to the back of the door frame. Just make sure you put it back when you're done, or we'll all be locked out. And do wash the concrete. It just kind of falls away, in places. Charmant. After you, detective. Nice. Have fun at your underground meeting, pig. Hope it's a blast. All right, we made it. We made it. Now, hopefully this doesn't take too long. Two young men are either oblivious to or ignoring your entrance. 
Their attentions are fixed on whatever it is they're stacking in the middle of the floor. Huh. Matchboxes, it appears. Ah. Oh. Okay. Um, maybe it's overheating, but it doesn't feel like it. So, uh, <laughs> while my webcam is just struggling, um, I will uh, just leave my game on for a little while. I'll let it cool down, and then I will be back. Okay, I think I fixed the problem. I don't know if it was an overheating issue. I think just one of my cables was actually loose, so it was just causing it to disconnect. I think we'll be good now, so let's continue. Matchboxes, it appears. I think it's holy, Ulexis. Ulexis. It is. Echo it's Maker. Holy. Harry Potter? It's definitely not holding. Those matchboxes are stacked so haphazardly, it's like they want them to collapse. <laughs> careful, careful. Oh. Oh. Well. Damn. Hardly any difference. The young man shakes his head and then looks up at you and the lieutenant with barely concealed irritation. You two. You are late. They should know the meeting starts at 10 p.m. sharp. Hey, come on. We didn't miss that much time. There's a great deal of tension in this young man's shoulders. More than someone his age should bear. Meanwhile, his companion inclines toward him, eager to catch every word that dribbles from his friend's mouth. Just a moment. Could this be the former owner of a certain jacket you acquired recently? Don't let them see you flustered, sire. Play along. Before we move on, do you recognize this jacket? Hey, Stubborn. Isn't that your jacket? What a coincidence. You two have the same jacket. What are the odds? Based on the prevalence of white Sarah Maritzian suits in Martinez, extremely low. It certainly looks like my jacket, Ulexus. Where did you get that gendarme? <laughs> gendarme. Um. Ah, uh, so I just found it in a room. So this is hit. This is that dude's room. In the. Uh, <laughs> it's that dude's room in the uh, in the apartments. I just found it in a room. Do we be honest with him or go? It must be a coincidence. I see these jackets all the time. Just found it in a room. Yeah, I'm sure you did. That's real Sarah Maritzian twill. Only old Sarah Maritzian communists and drug smugglers wear those anymore. Okay. He is neither of those, of course. He is simply a poor student <laughs> putting on ears. Also, he doesn't have the shoulders to fill out such a jacket. Okay, maybe not. See, Uli? It's just like Mazovrot. How does it go again? Those committed to the rights of property are those most apt to violate them. Just a minute. Steban. Ulixis. Why do those names ring the faintest of bells? Probably because they're the real names of Naztep and Exilus, the authors of that so-called essay about Tip Top Tone you read. Ah. You should get to the bottom of this when you have the chance. I assumed it was Maurice who broke into my room to play a trick on me. I didn't think I'd actually been raided by the RCM. It is his room, there you go. There is surprise in his voice, naturally. But is that a note of excitement you also detect? So do you want your jacket back? Absolutely not. You have to keep it. Can you imagine the look on Maurice's face when he finds out the RCM has been kicking my door down? <laughs> he shit himself, positively. <laughs> And now they've shown up in force to break up our meeting. <laughs> the music is so prominent in this uh, in this part of the game here, in this scene. It's taken over the voice. <sighs> Something tells me these young men are not very experienced with law enforcement. Hold on, we're not here to break up your meeting. We want to join your meeting. The RCM wants to join us? My partner, of course, is acting in a strictly personal capacity, not as an official representative of the RCM. Interesting. Does that mean you've done the reading? Uh-oh. No 
No one said anything about reading. You'll just have to win this one. Just wing it. The reading, yes, uh, I've definitely done that. You have? Excellent. Let's hear your critique then. I thought the themes were interesting. They always say that when they haven't done the reading. Damn it. I'm pretty sure any of those answers would have totally had the same response. Well, this is getting awkward. I'm not sure what you're expecting to find here then. There's profound consternation in his voice. You suspect it's about something bigger than you're not having done the reading. Maybe they can explain themselves. What exactly are you two doing here? In the most generous sense, I would say we're cultivating revolutionary consciousness. Yes, that's probably the best way to describe it. But more specifically, we are running a reading group. The most rigorous and theoretically advanced materialist reading group in Martinez. Comrade Steban is a great discussion leader. One of the best at the university. It's obvious they take this group of theirs extremely seriously. Whatever you do, don't compare it to a common book club. And then, of course, sounds like just like a regular book club. Sounds like a place for intense intellectual engagement. Exactly my kind of jam. That's our whole thing. The world is so shallow, all noise and repetition. We're interested in genuinely radical critique. Precisely. We are not interested in senseless parroting. We like to read critically. Within the contours of Mazovian historical materialism, course. I didn't realize they taught radical Mazovian theory in the un in the universities. Huh. As though you can call that problem teaching. <laughs> One thing you learn quickly at university is that you're not going to find a real education in any lecture hall or discussion seminar. We are post attendance, basically. Exactly. The only worthwhile part of the so-called equal normal de Revachol is the library. That's where we've made our greatest critical strides. Okay, so what does your reading group actually read? We study all the foundational texts of Mazovian theory, of course. Just last week we finished the second volume of Puncher and Watman's Innocence of Capital. It's truly really extraordinary. <laughs> and before that we spent six weeks on state and plasm. For some reason the word plasm catches in your ear like a piece of old wax. <laughs> Uh-oh. You can feel your attention span rapidly deteriorating. Force yourself to keep listening. We've also read Wert Müller's The Mega Structure of History, and before that, Real and Reality. Communist theorists love puns, in case that wasn't obvious. Ablaus in pain fernal. The original Fisdale translation, not that worked down revisionist garbage. These two deserve the order of honor for bullshitting. There's no way they've actually read all this stuff. Obviously. <laughs> but, of course, our special emphasis is on the theories of Ignis Nilsson and his followers, especially the inframaterialists. I know who Krasmazov is, but who is this Ignis Nilsson guy? Only Krasmazov's most trusted lieutenant, the evangelist of the revolution, and the founding father of the People's Republic of Samara. It's hard to overstate how unimpressed he is that you've never heard of this world historical individual. He also happens to be the greatest communist theorist after Mazov himself. It was Nielsen who first postulated the existence of ideological plasma, which forms the basis of inframaterialist theory. Those words again. You've got to find out what this inframaterialist stuff is all about. Whatever it is, one thing's perfectly clear. These young students have a much deeper understanding of communism than you do. Perfect. I will recruit them to my army and we'll make that 0.001%, 0.003% because there'll be an extra two of them. You could learn a thing or two from them. If you can convince them, you're one of them. We gotta do it. I'm wearing the hat. The young man sighs. His companion looks about furtively. Where's the rest of the reading group? What do you mean? This is the reading group. <laughs> Choose all you need. Me and Kim are the same way. Turn to Kim. Kim and I. <laughs> he corrected me on his grammar. Come on, come on, Kim. He scribbles something in his notebook, but adds nothing else. We're in something of a rebuilding phase. 
Some of our former comrades didn't have the ideological fortitude our work demands. Okay, but what happened to them? Intellectual attrition is maybe the best way to describe it. Felix said he couldn't keep up with the reading on top of his classwork. And Zuzana wanted to read texts other than Mazovian theory. Like novels, if you can believe it. Mm -hmm. Imagine the audacity of wanting to read a novel in a reading group. Novels. Unbelievable. See? Even the gendarme gets it. We've tried recruiting new members, but unfortunately the current intellectual climate is pretty hostile to inframaterialist thought. These days, if you're on the left, the ascendant schools are the Godwalians and their iconoclards. Don't forget about Maurice and the turnips. <sighs> right. Then there is the whole turnip debacle. What's so bad about the Gotwaldians? They're the most depressing school of communism. They love writing long books with a patina of Mazovian theory to cover up their cheap psychologizing. A gang of cheap psychologists and intellectual midgets. <laughs> Typical Gottwalders, in other words. It's okay for Uli to say that because his dad is from Gottwald. What's so depressing about their theories? The Gottwald school believe that intellectuals as a class are incapable of sparking revolutionary change. So all they can do is critique capitalism from inside itself. In other words, they have lost faith in their own relevance. That's why they spend all their time smoking cigarettes and writing long works of criticism that make you want to commit suicide. Goddamn, that sounds miserable. It is miserable. That's probably why they're always committing suicide. You see, the Gottwald school look like communists. They talk like communists. But scratch the patina and you'll see beneath that they're just depressed liberals who've read too many books. Okay, but what about the uh, iconoclads? For starters, they love talking about beans. <laughs> What's wrong with beans? I like beans. I love talking about beans. Oh no, we're not getting into beans, are we? What's wrong with beans? Beans? That's right. Iconoclards are obsessed with beans. They love thinking about beans. They love counting beans. But most of all, they love building models to predict how many beans there will be in the future. Okay. Nota bene, Iconoclard is an extra pejorative form of the already pejorative name, Mazovian Economists. A moderate school of Mazovianism which advocates the gradual transition to communism through carefully managed economic modernization rather than violent social revolution. Okay. They're by far the most bean-centric school of communism. <laughs> Just... Beans! Ah yes, the much maligned bean counters, ensconced in their think tanks and high-rises, believing they can save the world through a series of incremental, assiduously technocratic reforms. I don't get it. Are the beans a metaphor? If only. They've got all the beans accounted for in their asset sheets, their quarterly budgets, their future projections. But for some reason, there are never enough beans to go around. So we've just got to cut our bean rations in half. The next thing you know, there are budget cuts. So now we've got to cut the bean rations in half again. You see, iconoclards claim to be communists. But in reality, they were just liberals with hard-ons for spreadsheets. And what about the liberals? Are they liberals too? Of course not. The only people who actually call themselves liberals are mouth-forming reactionaries. Basically indistinguishable from fascists. You'd need an X-ray machine to tell the difference. What about Cindy? Is she part of the group? Cindy is... How to describe her role? Something of an ideological auxiliary, perhaps. Yes. That's exactly how I would put it. And naturally, we support her radical counter-liberal aesthetics. But she refuses to submit an essay, so we can't call her a member of the group per se. Okay. That doesn't stop her from using the room for studio space, of course. Did you say something about turnips? <sighs> it's an unfortunate story. You see, our ex-comrade Maurice is something of an economist. He's studying macro and microeconomics. Wow. A real intellectual, it sounds like. <laughs> right. So a few weeks ago we were discussing the extra physical capabilities of the revolutionary state. And Morris said... What were his exact words, Ulexis? 
It was unbelievable. He said, turnips don't care if they are grown by communists, moralists or Vulcan. They grow just the same. Basically, he was rejecting the whole foundation of inframaterialist theory. What is this inframaterialist business they keep blathering about? You've never heard of anything like it. Just go along with it. Susanna said that he has been hanging out with some non-communists lately. For us, the question boiled down to, if you don't even accept the basic ideas of Nielsen and inframaterialist theory, why are you in the rating group? I totally understand. Of course you do. It's pretty basic stuff. So you expelled Maurice from the reading group over an argument about turnips? Well, it wasn't so much that he was expelled. He just quit coming. We haven't seen him around for weeks. Okay, I've heard enough. Let's talk about something else. Go ahead. What were you doing with those matchboxes just now? The young man frowns at the little pile of boxes on the floor. Nothing. Just messing around until the meeting started. They're watching those matchboxes awfully <laughs> intently for two guys who are just messing around. It's almost as though they were trying to create the most unstable structure they could with predictable results. Do I know you two from somewhere? I don't think so. Unless you've been hanging around the culture studies faculty at the Ecole Normale de Revachol. Perhaps he subscribes to La Fumée. That's sarcasm. He does not expect you to subscribe to radical communist periodicals. I'ma show it to you. Wait, you guys wrote for this? You've read our article. For the first time since you've met the young man, words seem to desert him. That I did not expect. <laughs> the energy in the room has shifted ever so slightly in your favor. They're afraid they've somehow embarrassed themselves in front of you. Well, don't keep us on tenterhooks. What did you think of the essay? The delicate egos on these boys. Even though you're just some cop, they're desperate for your approval. Mm. Hey, you're not just some cop. You've got highly developed critical faculties. Now's your chance to show them off. It was a good article. You should keep developing your ideas. Well, of course that's just an initial foray into the subject. We're hoping to return to it for a more substantial treatment next term. In any case, I'm glad our piece found its audience. That's always the hope with these things, you know. Is the reading group accepting new members? We typically only accept new members once per semester. There's this whole process with essays and presentations on assigned topics. But given that we have some extra seating at the moment, I guess we could be convinced to expedite an application or two. Stepan, you can't be serious. For these gendarmes? I am serious. As materialists, we've got to adapt to conditions as they are. Besides, he still need to pass the interview portion of the entrance process. Assuming he's even still interested, that is. I do love a 97% check on my composure. Convince them you belong in the reading group. What's there to be scared of? You've really been cracking the books these last few days. You can go toe to intellectual toe with any reading group in Martinez. Composure, don't you mean I've really been cracking the books? Beans! You've spent a not inconsiderable amount of time arranging the works in your mental library by theme and period. All the ideas and references you need are ready at hand. I'm prepared. Now, chin up. You've got this. This is just the group I've been looking for. When do we start? Oh, you want to start now? Sure, we can manage that. I'm pressed for time. I need to obtain a gun, put my p partner to sleep, tuck him into bed, and interview a potential suspicious lady on top of a balcony, and then go to sleep myself, and then, you know, there's a whole th thing going on right now, so I'm, you, we gotta get to this, man. You've caught him off balance. Let's go. The momentum is already in your favor. That's right. Go ahead and take a seat. Since we haven't had time to prepare an exhaustive questionnaire, I think we can keep this interview more freeform. Why don't you tell us a bit about the books you're interested in, and we'll just see where the conversation goes. 
Like you guys, I really get into political and historical subjects. I'm more into practical books, books that help me understand the real world. Let's, let's just appeal to them here. Absolutely. It's the only proper foundation to develop a real understanding of events. There might be something to that. I recently finished The Greatest Innocence. I think that's probably better than saying the Heim Delaman books. <laughs> hmm. Don't think I'm familiar with it. Give us a quick summary, if you don't mind. Okay. This is a good start. They're starting to loosen up. You feel relaxed and in control. You quickly gloss Lopez de Fuego's essential argument, peppering it with your own commentary and asides. Like a river emptying into the sea, the discussion winds its way toward the character of the innocence herself. But then, any critical account of Dolores Day's reign has to seriously reckon with her atrocities in Margaritania and La Vuelta during the Mesk secession, don't you think? Honestly, I did get the impression there was something inhuman about her. The whole innocentic system practically requires that. Without true gods, we are made to set them up for ourselves. If he wants a real critical history, he's got to read on the material conditions of the Mirovan Boilermakers. He's so good. Brutally revelatory. These kids are eating out of your hand, practically. Another quarter of an hour disappears. The questions come rapid fire, but you have an answer for every one. Now you can sense things starting to slow down. The interview must be reaching an inflection point. But to Comrade Ulix's point, isn't there value in reading really difficult books just for the sheer challenge of it? Listen. Books are fine and all, but to be straight with you, they're no substitute for a real story. Okay, we'll bite. What sort of stories are we talking about? A real-life procedural, complete with gory details. How about a tale of adventure, intrigue, and daring do? Interesting. Okay, so we've got the human body starts to do some weird things when it's been in a tree for seven days. How I infiltrated the wild pines for my investigation. Let me tell you about a little incident I had with this woman at my hostel. And you ever heard of a thing called sudden onset, uh, onset acute amnesia? Let's go with uh, let's go with the main one here, the first one. You've got our attention. Let's see where this goes. Yes, I'm rather curious myself. Now you're getting somewhere. These boys aren't even bothering to contain their interest. They want to see how you weave the threads of this story together. <laughs> Even the lieutenant seems engrossed, despite your revealing details of an RCM investigation. Okay, but when you say he spoke to you, you mean metaphorically, right? Right, of course. I'm really talking about my top-notch forensic skills. The work he did on the autopsy was quite good, I can confirm. So have you figured out his real identity? Another quarter of an hour disappears. The conversation bounces back and forth. Whatever their pretensions, it's clear these two have been craving something real. Now you can sense things starting to slow down. Time to wrap this tale up. But I'm still not sure how love did him in. There has to be some other elements with. We don't have the full story yet. Perhaps, but that thread of the story is still unresolved. I suppose we'll have to leave it there. But listen, John Don, we could use someone with your breadth of expertise. With just a little more theoretical background, I think you'll be able to make some real contributions. Yes, I would say he's got serious potential at least. And with that, welcome to the most ideologically advanced materialist reading group in Martinez. Here's your first assignment. It's an overview of inframaterialist theory. A little basic, as you'll see, but one has to start somewhere. I'll add it to my very extensive reading list. You're going to fit right in, I think. Come back when you're done. We'll be here pretty much every night after 10 p.m. Okay. Do be sure to take your time with the reading. We'll be eager to hear your thoughts. Nice. Okay. Mmm, coffee. <laughs> At the bottom of the pot, an isle of black sludge rises from a shadowy sea. This poster reads, Under the cobblestones, communism. This one says, no war, but class war. And a rickety easel surrounded by pots of goosh. Cindy's, no doubt. Could it be the Phasmid? No, 
Probably not. Try not to think about the cracks spidering out across the floor. <laughs> so good. Okay. Kind of chilly tonight, Ely. Alright, we got the meeting done. It is half an hour past midnight. We have a book to read, but we have... We are crunching time right now. We got stuff to do. So a concise introduction to inframaterialist theory intended for a general audience. You can tell this particular copy has spent a lot of time in someone's back pocket. Now, knowing that they are they were here, we could have we could have seen them much earlier, I think, because we went to a different we went to a different place. Um, we assumed that this was in a different spot, and that's why we missed it, and we probably could have come here much later uh, on an earlier day. Which is funny. Reflective construction vest. Plus one endurance, minus one reaction speed. Let's have a look at this. Safety first and impossible to miss. A ludicrously reflective safety vest like those favored by construction and road repair crews. Comes with a replaceable battery pack. Makes you feel like a deep sea anemone. <laughs> Alright, so... Read a brief look. So we've got reading a brief look. Apparently Placence's white check has now unlocked as well. But we have things to do. We'll be back. So I wonder if that means they will just be here um, until 2 as well. God, I wish that I just came here the previous night instead of um, what we did before. And assumed it was on the other side of the balcony. God damn. Okay. Well, what we can do now is we've got um, an hour and a half. We've got two and a half out. No, an hour and a half. Yeah, an hour and a half until... Um, the gun, cutoff point, an old poster below new ones, Arno Van Eyck, 49, the Palisium. Sounds like an obscure live performance in a dirty underground bunker. Um, now, um, I need to check if, um, Classy is still on her balcony. If not, that means we'll miss her window, and I'm trying to figure out how we can... That means I think we'll have to wait a whole other night. Because I don't I don't see any other way to get Kim away from me <laughs> to do it, you know? The musty smell of a potato cellar in spring emanates from the air vent. Yeah, she's gone. Below the grime, a dark neon poster reads, Van Eyck, totally transcendent. Yeah, she's out. So, yeah, we, we can't... We can't get everything done in, in one night, so... <sighs> if I want to talk to Classier alone, it, it means I'm going to have to try and push forward a whole other day again. Because unfortunately, you're not able to spend a bit of the morning without Kim, because he'll end up at your shack, or he'll just be with you in the morning in um, the Whirling. So all we can do now is we can get the gun, we go to bed, and then we'll be on day six. And there's not, there really isn't a huge amount for us to do left uh, before we, you know, move into stuff. I was really curious to get this one done, but we'll have to see how things pan out, because either we'll end up having to skip and fast forward through... Um, have to skip and fast forward through day six to get to the night time again to make Kim go away, uh, or we just leave the task. Um, now. Someone's been running around with your sidearm. Meet her near the old fish market at 10 between 10 and 2 to get your service weapon back just walk past the fishing village until you see the boardwalk so we're walking past the fishing village till we get to the boardwalk it's dark out here Kim Are we doing it out here, or are we going somewhere else? Okay, 
Okay, not here. Walk past the fishing village onto the boardwalk. Trying to get my gun back. Water runs from the west. The source is upstream. A broken pipe. Where is this gun meeting gonna trigger from? Is my question. Because this just goes up towards the church. Not entirely sure. Where's this person who has my gun? God damn it. Said they'd be there from 10 till 2, so we still should be able to find them, right? Uh, so what we're doing at the moment, just to make sure that maybe we haven't messed up, is I've just reloaded a save uh, from when it w it's still 10. And I'm going to check if maybe there's been a window that's been missed. Because the reason why I thought that we could do this much later was because we got confirmation that um, uh, the, it would be from... There you go. What the hell? We got confirmation uh, this person with our gun would be there from 10 until 2. And we definitely went there before too, and I certainly did not have raving sirens and my gun right there. So, what we're going to do here is I'm now going to have to, we're going to do the gun first. <laughs> and then we'll see if we can check on this meeting and just be very late for it for the communism thing and maybe still get that done as well. I'm just wondering if we can do both. We'll just have to see how this works. So, here's our gun. The pigs. With her siren on her... Thank god damn it. Harry, why did you have to pawn your gun? The aging woman under a mountain of police paraphernalia mumbles to herself, then notices you and reaches for the megaphone. God damn it. This will be such an annoying person to have out at night. Show me your hands. This is the pigs. Show me your hands. Right now! Show me your hands! Right now! Scavenged, battery-powered police lights protrude from her back. The flickering light show reveals a gun in her shaking hand. Her hand is trembling from some sort of neurodegenerative disease. Madame, please drop the firearm immediately. Kim. Kim, my gun is my gun's probably not even loaded. Easy, ma'am. Take it easy. Failure to comply. Suspect is displaying aggression. Officer, under duress. Officer, under duress. Her eyes bulge with terror. Veins protrude on her forehead. I am the police. Don't move. Don't move. Hands on your head. Suspect is armed and dangerous. Ma'am, I need you to calm down. We just want to talk. Lateral vascular neck restraint. Carotid sleeper. Sleeper, critically reducing blood from passing through the neck of the suspect. Be careful, detective. Don't do anything that might set her off. You are aiming a gun at her, Kim. The situation looks bad. Calm yourself. Steady your breathing. You'll have to go for the gun sooner or later. Perhaps you can learn crucial facts before you do. This is the pigs. It's a hand-eye coordination check. Okay. We can solve this peacefully. Please lower the weapon. Officer, I need assistance! Suspect, alert! Get on the ground! Ma'am, please. We want to help you, but you need to lower that weapon. Let's just talk, alright? Disturbance reported. Authorized deadly force. Sector, take the shot! Be 
Big Red Key! Big Red Key! Big Red Key. That's code for the battering ram. Cop talk. You know this. Please identify yourself, ma'am. It's a goddamn police shitbag. Cut the pavement. You're under arrest. As she waves her hands, you notice familiar looking ampoules and packets sticking out of the mountain of police gear on her back. Medicine or drugs? She thinks she's a police officer. Try treating her like a police officer. A lower ranking police officer. Officer Pigs, double your freighter Harrier Du Bois. Dubois, requesting your sidearm for inspection. Hold out your badge. What? She lowers the megaphone and stares at the gun in her hand. Patrol officer, you're in gross violation of the RCM code of conduct. She hesitates, looking around in confusion. The three-barreled pepper box wavers in her hand. In this moment of hesitation, she almost doesn't seem disturbed but like someone suddenly waking from deep sleep. Patrol officer, I have to sign you up for a disciplinary hearing. Slowly shake your head. Easy. Press her too hard, she? Too late, Lieutenant. Oh, uh, I thought that might have been too much. With a swift, poorly coordinated move, the woman slams the megaphone against her lips and teeth. A trickle of blood runs down her chin. She doesn't notice it. Officer Corkamari, unlawful impersonation! Pigs on route! Engage your will! Okay. She's actually more agitated now. My bad. It did go up though. Are you on drugs? Confiscated contraband. Restricted access. Two kilos missing. Our witness were past compromised. I don't think she's on drugs. Being off drugs might actually be the problem here. Okay. Hand eye coordination. I can improve this. Once more, with time to get my gun. Hang on a minute. We can't leave. The delirious civilian is pointing fire at us. I know. I, I we need to solve this. I okay, Kim. Oh, I can't even level up my hand eye right now. We have a forty, a fifty-eight percent chance to do it. God damn it! You're not the police. We are the police. Lieutenant W. Freighter, Harrier Dubois, 41st Precinct. This is my partner, Lieutenant Kitsuragi from the 57th. No. Oh, no. No. Uh, I thought Mr. Moran. Gareth. Aggravated assault! Man down! Officer is pursuit! There's a scenario unfolding in her head right now. It has nothing to do with what's happening here. What's the situation, officer? Does she not believe you two are actually police officers? We really are cops. Look, my badge. Take out your badge and show it to her. License and registration! License and registration! Come in, dispatch! Sector! Sector! Azimuth! Jesus. It's not a code. Just disjointed words. Ah! Alright. Oh. Here's the plan. You hurled a ledger in her face, already darted right, and immediately closed the distance. Left hand grabs the barrel, right one breaks the wrist. No, that won't be necessary. Look closer. The gun, all three barrels, red and blue light shining through. It's not loaded. I know that. Kim, I'm almost certain there are no bullets in that gun. Huh? My god, I think you're right. Go ahead, pull the trigger, I dare you. She looks devastated. 
Grab the gun. Right now. This <laughs> might be your only chance. Imagine leaving it behind forever. Pick up your gun. God damn it. No one ever cares anymore. Why would they cheat me like this? This linden headed machine of pain and undignified suffering is grinding to a halt. Tired of walking the desert, it doesn't want to feel or think anymore. Poor woman. I need to figure out what to do with her now. God damn. Kim almost straight took her out. I'm like, come on, Kim. Nobody's ever around. Nobody ever comes to visit me. I'm very sorry this is how life turned out for you. Gently touch her shoulder. Her scratched skin is warm to the touch, but the person inside doesn't even know you're there. What do you think is happening to her? She's in a stupor. I've seen this before. God knows for how long. Could be days when they get like this. But why was she like this in the first place? Honestly, I don't know. Dementia, probably. Dementia and Channel 8 and loneliness. Neurodegenerative disease. Could be. Her hands were trembling and she did seem uncoordinated. But what are we going to do with her? Should we just arrest her? I don't think there's any need for that. In her current state, and without the gun, she isn't really a threat to anyone. We could let Titus know. This is a perfect problem for the local peacekeepers to handle. They might even know her family. <laughs> I was really hoping I can give her one of those station call slips. Um, look, I'll, I'll go with Kim on this one. Titus sounds like the man for the job, even though we are inflating their sense of self-worth. I think that'll be fine. Then we can ask him once we get back to the whirling. But we have to hurry, because it's late, and they might have already gone home. I'd say so, so we'll probably have to save that one for tomorrow. But I think we're done here for now. Let's head out. This is done. Please, leave the radio on. Reflex to what? Being left alone. She stands motionless. Just a heap of clothes and flashes now. Maybe if you search her once more. The woman stands slumped. She looks catatonic under her mountain of RCM paraphernalia. Is one of those things a police cap? There were narcotics in there too. You're thinking of taking them. Do. Pick up the RCM camp. She yep. doesn't even flinch as you reach out and disentangle the familiar looking Lieutenant's cap from her mountain of RCM paraphernalia. Oh, is that yours? It's hard to say. It's been so long since you wore yours. I think so. The Lieutenant nods. Confiscate the narcotics. You take the fire. Ah, oh, it's Perolodon. Bottle of speed. And speed. As evidence, obviously. She didn't consume them. She didn't look high. She confiscated them, a little like you are doing now. <clears throat> You're taking those, are you? Listen to him, for once. I'm confiscating these, as evidence. Fine, you take them then. Thank you. I'm doing this to help you. We need to focus on the case. Okay, man. He's grateful you did this. Okay. Shake her shoulder. The old woman doesn't react to your touch. Leave her be. I do wish we got to at least uh, read the description for the Perolodon, but that's okay. Woohoo! Villiers 9mm Pepper Box Pistol. Equip this when times are most dire. Triple barreled pistol. Look, that's so cool. Reminds me of uh, Vincent Valentine's triple barreled um, weapon from Dirge of Cerberus Final Fantasy VII. It just looks so cool. Cerberus, it was called. A three-shot revolving barrel Villiers Le Sale pepper box typically assigned to officers of the RCM upon reaching the rank of sergeant. The butt of the gun is worn and the engraving on the side reads, Sunrise Parabellum, this is your gun, no doubt about it. Hell yeah. Um, if it's a 9mm uh, gun, I'm pretty sure um, we... When times are most dire... Well, I feel like we might need that. We're going to need that for uh, for what lies up ahead, I think. Uh, we picked up a 9mm bullet, didn't we? 
Nice. Just have the gun on us now. Holding the gun feels natural and yeah, satisfying. Yeah, nice. It's like an extension of your arm. The polished wooden handle almost fusing into your palm. I think my hand recognizes it. It reminds you of the day you first held it with fear and respect, hoping you don't have to use it in vain. The sun was out in Jamrock. It was so long ago. This gun, Sunrise Parabellum, will be the only thing standing between you and the all-consuming nothingness that threatens to eat the world. Sheath it and wait, Herald. It won't be long now. Nice. Okay. Ask Titus Hardy and his boys to take care of the pigs, the woman catatonic on the boardwalk. It's their district, their mess, their responsibility. We'll do that tomorrow morning. Nice. Uh, that didn't take anywhere near as long as I thought it would, which means while it is still at this point in time, uh, we may be able to go back and I'll do this meeting now. So I should have done the gun first. Interestingly enough, she wasn't around between the hours that we were told that she would be. Uh, so she just disappears when it still gets like a little too late, I suppose. Um, probably don't need to be wielding my gun when I go to this meeting, but um, I'm just hoping that I'm actually able to do it when I, when I need to. So let's travel back to the Martinez waterfront and I'll see if I can actually go back in this door uh, and have this meeting take place. Otherwise, uh, that gives us an excuse to uh, need to wait and skip ahead on day six to night time, put Kim to bed, interview Classier uh, around nine, I suppose, and, and then... Um, and then do the communism meeting. But I'm... I'm hopeful that it's because it's within the first hour that we might just be late. And I should just be able to power through this as I uh, already have before, and then we can go to sleep. Nice, okay. I am still able to access this, I'm pretty sure. As you approach them, this must be somehow. Perfect. Okay, no. we can still do it. So I just needed. <laughs> I just needed to do the gun first. All right, we've done the gun. You've got. You guys have already seen the communism section because I did it before. So I'm just going to power through this now and get it complete once again, uh, and then we can move on. Okay, I've done exactly what I did the first time uh, in this place. Uh, so we've gone through the motions once again to get read a brief look at inframaterialism so we've got the book that we can interact with a concise introduction to inframaterialist theory intended for a general audience you can tell this particular copy has spent a lot of time in someone's back pocket the cover of this pocket-sized volume features a swirl of orange yellow and green the title a brief look at inframaterialism is set in an authoritative yet approachable serif font. Comic Sans. What an interesting color palette. It's vibrant, yet somehow leaves you ever so slightly nauseated. On the inside jacket flap, you find a brief summary. What is inframaterialism? A highly theoretical branch of Mazovian communism? A collection of mystical ramblings by a discredited revolutionary? Or possibly both? This brief look TM introduces readers to one of this century's most fascinating and misunderstood theories in a concise, jargon-free manner. So far, so good. You turn to the table of contents. The guide itself is divided into several sections with seemingly esoteric titles like Effects of Plasm on Root Vegetables and Mental Projection and Transference. There's also a brief introduction about the life of Ignis Nielsen. Read the introduction on Ignis Nielsen. Known to his numerous admirers as the evangelist of the revolution and to his even more numerous enemies as the apocalyptic Shrike, Ignis Nielsen remains one of the most controversial and fascinating figures to emerge in the years of the anti-centennial revolution, second only to Kras Mazov himself. During his unparalleled life, he helped guide a revolution in one country and found a new state in another. Along the way, he committed some of the most notorious war crimes in an era famed for its atrocities. And yet, his most fascinating contribution to history 
may be the most overlooked. His theory of ideological plasm from which his followers and successors developed the school of communism known as inframaterialism. Start reading the first chapter. If you're like most people, you probably believe that your thoughts reside in your brain, right? No, it is stored in the balls. That's not right at all. Thoughts don't exist in the brain. They float through the air. Your brain is but a fish swimming through them. I love that description though. I always thought I swam through them. Very interesting. And not so far removed from Ingus Nielsen's own theories. Mm -hmm. As Mazel's devoted comrade and leading theoretician, Nielsen was responsible for developing much of the intellectual foundation of communism. But his interests and speculations were famously wide-ranging. During his final years in exile, he produced, among other things, an early guide to home brewing, instructions for raising revolutionary children, plans for a universal pictographic language, and a detailed materialist critique of Dolores Day's chess strategy. A true man of ideas, equal to any of the great DeLorean polymaths. But one subject he returned to time and time again was the fundamental relationship between thoughts and matter. We may yet discover, he wrote in his notebooks, that under certain exceptional circumstances, the proletariat's embrace of historical materialism may be so fervent that their beliefs take form in the world of matter as a kind of revolutionary plasm. Hold on, can you put that in slightly more basic terms? Certainly. In essence, Nielsen is arguing that thoughts don't just reside inside the brain, they radiate outward from it. According to this idea, the brain is an ideological transponder, constantly emitting waves of highly politicized energy, which Nielsen called plasm. Plasm. Whoa. Whoa is right. What's more, Nielsen speculated that this plasm, when it becomes powerful enough, might begin to influence the material reality surrounding it. Hence the name, inframaterialism. So that, that, that rich guy, he's, he's, he's uh, influenced material reality around him. He's light bending. Unfortunately, Nielsen passed away before he was able to develop these initial ideas into a full-fledged theory. That work was left to subsequent generations of communist theorists. Building on Nielsen's basic insight, these theorists reached a startling conclusion that a sufficiently revolutionary state might begin to exhibit certain extra-physical effects based on the amount of plasm generated by its citizens. So these people are saying that if enough people just believe in communism, it will come true. Wait, so this isn't even Nielsen's theory, it's his followers. Correct. Though certain particulars of the theory are commonly attributed to Nielsen himself, the evidentiary basis of those attributions has always been a point of contention between inframaterialists and their critics. So these people are saying that if enough people just believe, it will come true. The actual theory is highly technical, but for the purposes of this brief look, TM. TM, that's a fine working definition of the concept. That's because this is absolute idiocy, not even worth engaging with. Communism is doomed. We'll never get af plus that after that uh, 0.001%. No, no, no. There's something here. You can feel it. All right, let's hear about this extra physical stuff. Inframaterialists divide the extra physical effects of the revolutionary state by the level of plasm required to achieve them. At the lowest or first level, revolutionary plasm is believed to stimulate or invigorate matter without altering its essential properties. It sounds like that business with the turnips. Precisely, though plasm does more than increase vegetable yields. It may also influence the physiology of revolutionaries themselves. It's also been postulated that plasm may account for the remarkably full and manly facial hair observed on some communist males. Shoulda kept those mutton chops. God damn it. <laughs> Stroke your bare chin and imagine what it would be like if you did not shave. 
Your hand feels clammy against your <laughs> kitchen. You wipe it along the back of the book and keep reading. Of course, inframaterialists argue that revolutionary plasm may stimulate human physiology in other ways as well. In fact, reports from the revolutionary period claim that the most radically devoted communards were able to engage in vigorous intercourse for up to eight hours at a time. Eight hours? There's no way. Your equipment would be mashed to jelly. Insurance, please. No wonder the communards couldn't shoot straight. <laughs> they were too shagged out. Hyperproductive oh, man. and ultra-horny communards are fine. But this theory hasn't quite gotten strange enough for you. And on that note, you feel like you've gotten the general idea of inframaterialism. Enough to carry on a basic conversation, at least. But if you'd like to go even deeper into some of the more speculative aspects of the theory, you could always read further. Return to the group for discussion. Okay. Of course you want to go deeper. What else are you here for? The book fits quite snugly into your palm. It would also fit comfortably into a jacket pocket. Keep reading. You flip forward a few pages until you come upon a chapter titled Mental Projection and Transference. When a community has achieved a sufficiently high degree of revolutionary fervor, inframaterialists believe that second level effects may be observed. At this second level, certain hyper-revolutionary individuals may even develop the ability to extend their thoughts into material space and vice versa. Wait, does that mean communists can read minds? According to inframaterialist theory, yes. Under suitably revolutionary conditions, that is. Of course, one doesn't need to be a communist to be attuned to the thoughts of your brothers and sisters. It's become something of a folk legend that during their final meeting, Nielsen and Mazov didn't speak a single word, preferring to sit in silence with their chamomile tea, reading one another's thoughts. That's strangely beautiful. One of the minor tragedies of the late revolutionary period is that few reliable accounts survive. Much of what we know of the communards' activities during this period come from memoirs and second-hand accounts, some only written down decades after the fact, and of dubious authenticity. Hey, Kim, you'd say that we share a pretty special connection, right? I suppose we do work quite well together. You and me, we're on the same wavelength. It's, it's why we're always finishing each other's... Your words hang in the air as the lieutenant scribbles something in his notebook. At some point, he realizes you're waiting for him and looks up with a tightly knit brow. Cigarettes. It's true that you and I do share a similar addiction, but that's hardly remarkable among officers of the RCM. It's because you were supposed to finish the sentence, Kim. As we were saying, it's generally believed that these effects are only exhibited by certain hyper-revolutionary individuals. Generally, less than 0.01% of the revolutionary population. Let's do the other option. I suppose we... Your words hang... Sentences. The lieutenant looks at you evenly for a moment, then returns to his notebook without a word. Kim, you left me hanging there. Did I? My bad, detective. Won't happen again. <laughs> As we were saying... Rip. It's generally so why do these effects only work for hyper-revolutionary communists? Because plasm has never been directly observed, the exact mechanism behind these effects remains entirely speculative. In other words, there's no evidence that any of this mind-reading stuff is real. Why are you getting hung up on mechanisms? Open your mind's aperture just a little wider. You're so close to true understanding. Wait, if there's no evidence plasm exists, how can the theory be true? Most inframaterialists would argue that the inability of skeptics to detect plasm is simply evidence of their own insufficient revolutionary enthusiasm. There you have it, a perfectly unforcifiable loop. The theory is impossible to disprove on its own grounds. Meaning, it's hardly a theory at all. 
This should be more than enough for a stimulating discussion. That said, if you're still yearning for more, you must. Everyone knows books save their best parts for the end. Finish the book! You breeze through the next several sections until you arrive at the final chapter, titled A Communism Above Reality. When a society's revolutionary fervor reaches the third and highest level, inframaterialist theoreticians have postulated that the laws of physics cease to be laws. Cease to be laws? What do they become then? More like suggestions, according to some of the SRV's leading inframaterialists. Of course, it's impossible to say what exactly happens under these conditions. No known society has ever achieved the levels of revolutionary enthusiasm the theory seems to require. Some inframaterialists have even argued that it might require more plasm than humanity alone may be capable of producing. Wait, are there non-human sources of plasm? In the SRV, there have been attempts to organize certain species of aquatic mammals, as well as a few of the higher corvids. But as of this writing, only human beings have demonstrated the intellectual capacity for revolutionary communism. Has anyone ever gotten close to reaching the third level? There are numerous stories from Samara involving bandits or fascist mercenaries being levitated by farmers from the most ideologically advanced communes. Of course, few of these incidents have ever been rigorously investigated or substantiated. The form of these stories also recalls several well-known Samaran folk tales. In particular, the one commonly known as Clever Oleg and the Flying Magistrate. Among known attempts to channel third-level capabilities, the most well-documented is the curious case of Coalition Warship Debutante. Debutante. I've got to know what that's about. It concerns an interesting series of events that took place during the invasion of Revachol. As Coalition forces made landfall, a cadre of Nielsen's most fervent acolytes attempted to compress a Coalition aerostatic with their collective will. According to Communard law, these acolytes positioned themselves at the top of a redoubt just over the Bay of Revachol. From that vantage, they proceeded to visualize pinching Coalition warship debutant between their fingers, a gesture believed to assist in the extra physical materialization of their thoughts. Did it work? The acolytes, along with the redoubt, were vaporized in an artillery strike before the process could be completed. It's been said, though, that in the weeks following the battle, the captain of the debutante noted an increase in incidents of crewmen striking their heads on unexpectedly low bulkheads. Of course, colorful anecdotes only scratch the surface of what inframaterialists believe may be possible in a truly third-level society. What would a third-level society even look like? Some have theorized that such a society would be fundamentally unrecognizable, lacking many of the institutions we typically take for granted in advanced societies, including organized governments, financial institutions, and law enforcement. Oh, right. Da, da, ah. That book just ah. said there's no place for you in this future. Ah. Others have argued that people living under third level conditions will be immune to such infirmities as hunger, disease, and mental illness. A dream. In some of his later writings, Nielsen himself speculated about the potential for an extra physical architecture that disregards the laws of bourgeois physics and instead relies on the revolutionary faith of the people for structural integrity. Meaning the buildings stay up because people believe they'll stay up? Precisely. Nielsen observed that the financial system operates on the same principle of faith. So why not an architectural system? No communism architects, please. That's a terrible idea. On the following page, you come across a few black and white reproductions from Nielsen's own notebooks. One sketch depicts a government ministry shaped like a great inverted pyramid. A hectare in width at the top, balanced atop foundations the size of common apartments. That'll stay up. Another depicts a leaning tower wrapped in a dramatic helix. The caption beneath it reads, 
the Tower of History. That's a great image, though. Something about that tower looks awfully familiar. Could it be that's what the students were trying to recreate with the matchboxes? Oh, that's great. Plausible or not, there's something beautiful about this idea. Is there any more? Is there any more? There is no more. You've reached the outer theoretical limits of communism. And in less than 200 pages. God damn. If you'd like to read further, may we recommend a brief look at Occidental Architecture? Put the book away. We put that book away. All right. Hello. We read the book. You're back. Okay. I'm guessing these pots of... Uh, uh, of Gauche belonged to Sydney, uh, Cindy? Ah, uh, yeah, it's hers. She just sort of moved it all in a few months ago. She said if she's going to make truly radical art, she needs a suitably radical workspace. And I don't think she could afford rent at an actual studio. Do you like her art? Oh, sure. It's definitely interesting, I would say. Interesting? Isn't that just Bino Clark for I don't have a real opinion? Ah, uh, this... I'm being... The game's calling me out, dude. The game is calling me out. When things happen that I really like or I think are curious, I will go, interesting, as, like, a default statement when I don't feel like really getting into it. <laughs> and I've, I think I've done that for the entirety of my time on this channel is I will... Uh, by reflex, when something happens, even if it's not interesting at all, will go, interesting. Um, and if it is interesting, I'll also say, interesting. It just means I don't have the, the thought capacity to really break this one down right now, and I'm waiting for more information, or it's not worth getting into it. Interesting. <laughs> the, the game is putting a spotlight on me, because this is what I do. I thought interesting was what people said when they don't have anything real to add. His companion's eyes widen with interest. He has a cold smile. If this is what the Union man meant by theory combat, you've just scored a decisive blow. Oof. Come on. It's not that I don't have anything to say about Cindy's art. It's more that I'm still working out the details. Exactly. It's a complex question. You've got to take your time with it. Exactly. You've flustered the poor boy. Now he's got to say something. Hmm. I guess you could call her latest stuff a sort of counter-bourgeoisie calligraphy. She's got a real taste for radical slogans. It's too bad she hasn't developed the theoretical foundation to do truly radical work. I think she'll get there, though. She's still looking for a subject equal to her ambitions. Now I'm wondering, what's the deal with this place? The deal? At a fundamental level, I guess you could call it the shattered bones of a dream crushed by capital. That's really good, Stepan. You should save that for an essay. Thanks, Uli. When the idea is sound, the words just sort of flow. Yes. Now keep developing the idea. If this place is the shattered bones, that must make us the bone weevils. Hmm. Yeah, that's not bad. Not as good as Stepan's original idea, though. Thank you, Echo Maker. Let's move on. Go ahead. I'm ready. Let's talk about inframaterialism. Yes. Let's get right to it. Because otherwise, I'll have to go to bed, and then we have to wait until 10pm tomorrow, and I'm not doing that. We're staying up late. We're doing it now. His companion leans forward, ready to jump in. They're impressed that you dove right into the most advanced parts of the theory. Half an hour evaporates, and the conversation is still wending its way toward new and unexpected places. A cool breeze coming off the bay wraps itself around the Capeside apartments in a nearly forgotten part of that glorified construction site, surrounded by rusted pieces of scaffolding and walls of faded tarpaulin. A detective of the RCM debates the intricacies of an abstruse theory with a pair of university students. <laughs> that is exactly what's happening, Shivers. But if it's true that this individual possesses so much capital, that light literally bends around him, then that must mean... Yes, this individual possesses so much capital that light literally bends around him. I Exactly, that's what I was saying. It's the light bending dude in the, in the container. 
That capital produces its own form of plasm. In Innocence of Capital, Pancha and Wortman argue that communists must possess as little capital as possible in order to keep their thinking undiluted by its influence. Watch out. You call yourself a communist, and yet you've been accumulating a suspiciously large share of capital in just the last few days. It's almost certainly distorting your thinking. Again, he was just a regular high net worth individual. <laughs> there was nothing extra physical about him. Kim, your mouth dropped to the floor looking at him. Now the breeze has subsided. All is still except for the last bits of steam rising from the coffee pot. Well, on that note, I think we're gonna call it an evening. No, wait. Can this really be the end? You feel like you've just gotten to the real stuff. Come on, guys. Time has quite literally come to a standstill right now. We've been here for what seems like hours, but it's still 2.14 in the morning. We've got to strike while the iron and sickle is hot. Yes. One of our better discussions lately, on the whole. Hang on. Is that it? What do you mean, is that it? You've done the reading. We talked about it. What more do you expect from a reading group? God damn it. I expect more than 0.0001% of communism to be built. What if I have more questions, you know, about communism? Well, you could always ask, I guess. <laughs> you probably won't get a better chance, honestly. But it's getting late, so maybe pick the most important question. Oh, God, okay. Rhetoric, six. It's an even percent to red check. We did all the reading, which is great, but we're haunted by lost love. I need a minute to think about it. Come on. We have things to do in the morning. Oh, no. I'm, I'm out. Oh, God. Okay. It's still not high enough for me, but I don't want to put... I don't want to have to put two points into it. We should have been wearing more rhetoric clothes. Kim, what have I done? Ah! All right, here we go. Aww. Your available brain cells to coming up with a question about communism. Scratch that. To coming up with the question about communism. Wasted a the point. An amiga of communism questions. And that question is... Mm, I wasted a point in rhetoric for this. Oh god, that's bad. Surely I can think of something better. Maybe in another life, but not this one. Face it. This is the question that's been simmering inside you all along. Okay. No, no, no. This was supposed to take your mind off the other thing. Yeah, because it's the love thing. Hang on, I thought I was really getting into the theory back there. Sure. You spent some time getting lost in your theoretical labyrinths, but this has been the beast at the center this whole time. Maybe I should keep this one to myself. It's too late. You've already opened your mouth to speak. A woman bourgeois. The young man gives you a slightly confused look, as though he's sure you asked something else and he simply misheard. No, he heard you crystal clear. Somehow, it sounded even worse out loud. He wants to know if women are bourgeois, Stepan. Yes, I heard him. Give me a moment. What makes you ask that question above any other? I don't know, it's just what my brain told me to say. Ah, oh, God. They can't handle me. I'm a goddamn superstar. Maybe your problem is that you think it's their job to handle you. You ask that question because you're still under the influence of ideology. That's natural. You're like a fish that's only now discovering that her whole life has been dictated by the movements of sea currents. I'm just trying to give uh, Harry those superstar cop points. That's what ideology is. It's like there are these invisible forces everywhere. Pushing and tugging you this way and that, and you don't even know they're there. What does this have to do with communism? Everything, man. That is part of the communist project. To destroy the ideological structures that reduce men and women to these hollow shells of identity. Do you know the story of Dobrova and Abedanais? 
I know what you're talking about. Who were they? The so-called revolutionary lovers. The dual commissars of revolution in Insulinda. Yulia Dobrova came from Grad. Jean Abedanaeus was born in Revershaw. She was brilliant, charismatic, a revolutionary comet. He was her partner and stabilizer. The planet who kept her in orbit. What became of them, though? This seems to be a blank paragraph in the history books. It's from them we get the notion of dual leadership. The decomptage. Revachol's truly great contribution to revolutionary thought. I believe it even persists in some form in the RCM, even to this day. What happened to them? They died on their own terms, like real revolutionaries. There's a lot to say for that. Is that true, Kim, about the decomptage? I had no idea its origins went all the way back to the revolution itself. But it makes sense, in a way. What does this question say about me? Yes. That's the question you should be asking yourself. His companion nods, but offers no further solace. I need to take some time to think about this, or think about all this. The young man nods, but says nothing. He appears to be distracted by something. He's wrestling with some question of his own. He's lost in his own thoughts. You wonder what silt you've stirred in the bottom of his soul. Of course, the matchboxes. You'd very nearly forgotten to ask about them. Now may be your last chance. Here we go, the matchboxes. You were trying to t make the tower from Nielsen's journals. So you really did read all the way to the end. <laughs> yeah. Uli and I were trying to see whether there was enough plasm between the two of us to hold up a few matchboxes. Saying it out loud makes him realize how foolish it sounds. It was just a little informal experiment. No reason to take it too seriously. See, I said a silly thing that my brain told me to say. You said a silly thing. But we should try again, all of us. The young man looks at you a moment, then at his companion. What could it hurt? All right, let's give it another go. All right, let's go. You know what? I'll sit this one out. I don't think you want my skeptical materialism interfering. All right, Kim. The three of us will have enough plasm for each other. Before long, a modest tower begins to rise from the pile of matchboxes. You place every box with the utmost delicacy and precision. Easy, Uli. It's holding. It's holding. For the moment. Uh, at the moment, it looks like it's all on the ground, so I'm assuming it's going to just... The higher get the set up. Goes, there we go. <laughs> the quieter the room seems to become. Oh! From the occasional comment, the three of you are completely absorbed by the task. All right, you go next, Stepan. This is the most communist Jenga. The young man pushes back his shirt sleeves, revealing the pale flesh of his forearms. Say nothing. Is it? He's holding. He's holding. Yes. This is the closest we've ever gotten. It's almost exactly as Nielsen's sketch imagined. A physical manifestation of the dialectical spiral of history. All right, gendarme. Your turn. Oh god, I should have had some hand-eye coordination or something going on. You've got this. Theories aside, they're only matchboxes. Do you have interfacing gloves? Even the lieutenant is watching intently now. Ghost of Marzov, give me strength or take a deep breath. Oh god, I'm so, I'm stressed. Take a deep breath. It's... It's... Oh, it's so depressing! That's so sad. Oh. Oh, that hurt, dude. What if I, what, if I said Ghost of Marzov, give me strength, where maybe I did it? Or should I have just not, pre not proceeded, said it was too risky? Oh, man. Say nothing. Well, it may be that we found the outermost limit of our capabilities under the prevailing regime. Undoubtedly. Alternatively, it could be that our own ideological fervor is still insufficient. 
Yes, the problem is almost certainly your lack of commitment, and not say gravity. Harder to believe, but still possible. Either way, that's enough parlor games for one night. Thanks for humoring us. We should probably clean up. God damn. It was so close. Well, I think we're probably finished here, Detective. We're off. Wait a minute. If you don't mind, we wanted to get your opinion on something. A few little changes we've been thinking about. What kind of changes? Nothing too major, I think. We were talking potentially about relaxing some parts of our admissions process. Would help if you didn't make people go through a whole interview just to join. Ditch the pass phrase of meet in the coffee house. Have you considered changing up the reading list? Can I check? Can I go through all of these? Because all of these could probably be changed. That's interesting. I saw people love group interviews. No. I thought so too, but perhaps we overdid it just a little. There was another thing. We were also debating putting up some posters around town. Though some of us maintain that advertising is an unacceptably bourgeois tactic. That's what makes it so beautiful. <laughs> the irony is unbeatable. <clears throat> As a noted art cop, you definitely have an opinion on this. Sounds like something Cindy could help with. Think of it this way, you're appropriating bourgeois methods for revolutionary ends. Oh, I like that. We're dismantling the structures of capital with our own tools. Exactly. Hmm. It does sound pretty cool when you describe it like that. Plus, I've got the perfect place in mind. Put some more coffee on, Uli. We've got a long night ahead of us. We should probably get Cindy in here too. Nice. Oh, and gendarme. One last thing. I've been thinking about what you asked before, about women. You know? Not that it's any of my business. But it sounds like this question is really tearing you up inside. It is tearing you up. It's like there's a tiny hateful beast shredding your very soul. So, oh. good luck with that. I guess. Thanks, mate. Ah, <sighs> nice. Alright, well there you go. We did it. <laughs> we really broke down that communist theory we got organized there you go we're really close to just having the the friday tasks left to be honest god damn there you go all right thank you so much for joining me for this episode of disco elysium it was a big one It was a big brain communist one but we got our gun as well as many other things with joyce and everett it was a lot happening in this one next time we're going to go to sleep begin a brand new day day six in the morning uh and then get some more things happening potentially contemplate fast forwarding to the night again <laughs> to leave kim so we could uh interview classier but we'll see how that pans out we may just decide to proceed with confronting ruby and see how that goes so i'll see you next episode for day six in the next episode of disco elysium thank you